for the masses. Headline edition July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. <laughs> yeah. How you doing? It's Thursday night. February 1st, by the way. 32, day, 32 days into the new year. Just 333 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. Now, I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? Are you ready? It's Thursday. It is Fader Night. And the No More Fake Newsroom with John Rappaport, followed by Open Lines. The call-in numbers are 323-825-5045 or 323-275-9695. Serena Wright-Taylor is going to be here in a few minutes from the Conscious Life Expo. Tell us about some of the special events and tickets and that, all of that stuff. So we're going to do that in just a minute. Before that, follow on Twitter right now at J Church Radio. At J Church Radio. Come on, follow me. I'm a big, big social media person. Okay, well, I've got a lot of stuff going on. You know, fade to black and Rita and our lives and busy, busy, busy. And I still do the the social media thing. You know, I'm wondering, I mean, will it ever get to the point where, you know, I back off of Twitter or Facebook? Now, I haven't done Instagram. Uh, you know, we have an Instagram account. That's, uh, that's Rita's thing. So I don't do IG. That would be pushing things a little bit too far. Google Plus, MeWe, you know, all the other things that go on out there. Don't have the time. You know, I don't do uh, Reddit. I don't do any forums. I don't do 4chan. I, I just don't do it. I don't even read. I don't even look. I don't. I, I, don't, I don't have the time. But when, it, you know, Facebook has been um, uh, a part of this show uh, for so long that I, and and the relationships that are built there, I don't want to let that go. Same thing with Twitter, you know. So come and hang out with us. Everything that we do with this show is right there. Um, the conversations are always vibrant. So just come on over, hang out, and uh, communicate. Okay, all right. Twitter is at J Church Radio. Facebook, YouTube, everything is fade to black. Uh, my Facebook personal page that's that's been. It's been jammed up for a long time. It's weird. I don't know why they stop at 5,000. You know, people said, hey, man, just start a second Facebook page. Now, that's getting a bit much. Ain't going to go there. But uh, nonetheless, come and hang out with us, okay? The Sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. Now, what we do, hashtag F2B, right? What we do is we use TweetDeck. Tweet Deck. Go and find Tweet Deck. That's what you want to do. Go find Tweet Deck. Come back to us. Use the hashtag. Hey, hey, hashtag F2B. Fade or not, I just got Tweet Deck. Help me out here. That's all you got to do. Okay? And uh, we will come to your rescue. And then you can uh, get Tweet Deck all set up because it runs automatically, everybody. Uh, the thing is with Twitter, 
which most people uh, only see one version of Twitter. They don't they don't go deeper with it. Uh, with Twitter, got to click on notifications. You got to do this. You got to search for a hashtag. You got to click on all tweets or new tweets or new you know of whatever. I don't even do it anymore. I used to, but um, TweetDeck is automatic. Automatic runs automatically. So you pop up, you get a column going. Hashtag F2B. You get a column with you, your Twitter account, somebody else's Twitter account, maybe another hashtag. Well, whoever you want to engage in conversations with and and plug those in and then it clicks automatically. Boom, 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 boom. Something gets posted, clicks. I'm watching it right now. Click, 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 click. Holly Marie says me, so she's going to the Conscious Life Expo. Who is going to the Conscious Life Expo? Kicks off next week. It's our next thing next Friday. Who is going to the Conscious Life Expo? I saw about five or six me's there. There should be. Morgane says, you don't have TweetDeck yet? Go and get TweetDeck. Oh, your life will change. Get TweetDeck. Okay, you can also email throughout the show, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Let me get to, we're going to have a Serena uh, Wright-Taylor here in a minute. So I want to get a couple of uh, things out of the way. Um, I know that I said that I wouldn't mention anything about this for a couple of years or a year or whatever. Um, but no, this is a really big news. Bitcoin crashed today again. And it really, really crashed. The price dropped to the lowest level since November last year and its peak uh, in December to eight thousand five hundred and sixty three dollars the down that's where it, it kind of clawed its way back a couple of hundred dollars and and now it's going back down again um but the downward move follows a month for bitcoin when its market capitalization has tumbled from a high of 296 billion dollars on january 5th to $142 billion today, a $156 billion, wait for it, a 55% loss. Think about that, $156 billion. The Indian, the country of India, the Indian finance ministry today announced it is making, it has made Bitcoin illegal they are banning bitcoin in india wow wow unbelievable i i have no idea where this is going to be tomorrow all right a uh, couple of things really quick new mana and their new promo uh for the fader knots which is the jimmy 10 promo j-i-m-m-y 10 uh was extended through february 15th and that means you'll get 10% off of your order. You're going to get free shipping and an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt on any order over $100. Uh, the response has been phenomenal. Uh, we have shipped so many t-shirts. Okay, so Numana, and they don't do deals with anybody, are doing this just for the Fader Knots. So Jimmy 10 gets you that promotion. It's a win-win-win. Okay, you get to take care of your family, emergency food, you get the faded black T-shirt. You get free shipping. You get ten percent off. You get something that's made in America, GMO and and MSG free. It tastes great, and you have peace of mind. Okay, so there you go, Jimmy Ten. Click on the banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Now, as I said, next Friday kicks off the Conscious Life Expo. And it's February 9th through the 12th, 2018 at the LAX Hilton. Tickets and info um, are over at jimmychurchradio.com. All you have to do is click on the Conscious Life Expo banner. It's right there. And all of the events and the scheduling are posted. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black from the Conscious Life Expo, Serena Wright-Taylor. Serena, good evening. Good evening, Jimmy. Hello. I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. You're doing good. I, I said I started to answer the question. I'm doing <laughs> great because you and I have that synchronicity. We do it. Yeah. All, we do yeah. it constantly with each other. But I yeah. know you're great. You're always bubbly and happy, and things are always good in your world. 
Um, I, can you believe it? A year has gone by. Yeah, one I could week, hardly believe it. I know. One week from today, you're you're working. What what day do you start working out there? At the, at, <laughs> do you, <laughs> what do you what day do you guys start putting the show together? Well, really, officially, six months before. Um, so we're thinking about it. You know, July, August. You know, we're already thinking about it, and um, uh, even that's more than six months. Um, but I think about it all year, really, uh, because when I'm at different conferences or talking to you or listening to your, um, you know, interviews that you do, I'm thinking about how they would be good for the expo. So right. <laughs> I'm kind of thinking about it all year. Well, we do the same thing. We walk around the expo and we look at all of the uh, presenters and we're going, OK, let's get them for the show. You know, yeah, uh, we yeah. do we do it constantly. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. Do you guys start setting up? Uh, what Wednesday, Thursday? When, what? Yeah. Well, a lot of us are there on Wednesday. Um, Thursday is the main day that we're setting up, and then you know Friday morning finishing touches because it starts on Friday. You know, in the middle of the day. Right. Right. <laughs> Unbelievable. I, I just cannot believe it is here. Let's get a couple of things out of the way. I want to talk about some events and stuff. But mm-hmm. are there advanced ticket prices, and are they still available? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, it's really a good idea to get the advanced tickets online because you save. And people can come, even if you just get, for instance, Friday, um, it's $20 to get in. And there's so much to see, even without doing anything extra, that right. you wouldn't even cover it all. <laughs> right. So, yeah, and so then um, it would be 35 for Saturday or 30 for Sunday. Yeah, and there's so much free stuff going on. Um, but then if you pay a little bit more, there's all kinds of, um, you know, the special events, there's the workshops, um, there's so many much more. And you can get a silver pass for a three-day general admission. That's, that costs less um, at, online. You can get it 80 in advance. It's 90 at the door. So there's a big difference. And then this year... There's special all-access passes, um, which you can get if you go to the website, ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Um, and it's new this year. So you get the front rows, um, as, you know, seating at all the events um, for this all-access pass. So you can get it for Saturday, Sunday. Um, so it, that's really worth it, too. So there's all kinds of ways. And, of course, you can stay at the hotel, too. <laughs> if if someone wants, they can stay at the hotel and just wake up and go back in. Now, so, um, uh, what what if you get there and somebody's sitting in the front row seat? Can you kick them out? Oh, <laughs> well, that might be someone else with that, all that. I'm sense. just <laughs> playing. It's the Conscious Life Expo. We don't do that stuff that, there. It's about being be awakened. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but you, but you could sit on somebody's lap. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm digging yeah. that. I'm digging that. Okay, so now uh, a couple of things. Um, I, I'll let you go through. What are the what are the highlight e- events? Oh, there's so many. Um, well, I was I would like to talk about my panel because I, I love my panel. <laughs> it's, it's the UFO panel, and I, I might as well start with that um, and go backwards because that's on Sunday. Um, But the thing that we're talking about is consciousness related to UFO technology. And that's something I love to talk about because it's so important to understand that those advanced UFOs that we see, those advanced spaceships, they're vastly different from our technology. We can't compare it. And, And the thing is, some of them are actually alive. And we've talked about that before and some experiences I had when I was a child and how I saw you know, in space, there's beings that live, and, and they were traveling even when I was little, just like a pond, there's life in it. So space has life in it. So when I when I first met David Adair, who was on our panel, rocket scientist, I, I, went, I met him back in the 90s, early 90s, and he was talking about the engine that he saw at Area 51 that was alive, that was symbiotic. And that made so much sense to me, because I had had that experience. And also I'd learned about, you know, in the ancient Vedic scripts, and the Vedas, um, there's many different kinds of accounts of of spacecraft that are made in space and that are that communicate. They're conscious. They're not. Uh, they're not made of you know uh, mundane uh, material, so to speak. And um, and also he said when he saw that spaceship um, engine, that UFO engine, that it it must have been made in space. He understood when he looked at that. The technology could not have been made in gravity. So that's another thing that I read about 
in the in the scriptures in the Vedic texts that the um, that they are manifest or created in space by great architects, great ancient architects. So all that comes together, the ancient alien formation and everything, with what we're seeing, what people are experiencing as consciousness and technology and UFOs being connected, and that's how we can understand them more. And of course, Paula Harris is on our panel, and she's speaking at the Expo too, and her whole UFO conference is about um, consciousness and technology and consciousness and UFOs. And then we have um, an actual contactee, R Ricardo Gonzalez, on our panel. We have Stephen Bassett, Jason Quitt, Jaime Wilson, and, of course, Linda Moulton Howe. So we were, that's going to be so exciting. And everyone is also giving presentations um, during the whole weekend as well. And, okay, a couple of other, uh, let's go backwards. I, uh, are we going to go backwards? We're going to start a Friday and <laughs> go back know, forwards. We can go anywhere you want. Well, we no, started with Sunday. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, uh, okay, let's, uh, I've already announced, you know, the Ancient Aliens panel that I'll be hosting. That's Friday night. That'll be kicking yeah. off things. Um, and then Saturday night, what are, or Saturday day, uh, what are the highlights there? Oh, there's so much there. So George Norrie does his two events on Saturday, of course. And um, so he'll have his big um, forum, which is um, a more than a panel. It's a lot of speakers, um, including some of our favorites. You know, David Wilcock, of course. Um, uh, ha Nassim Harmain is there. Um, uh, let's see who else is on the panel. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to look for the page because i got so, there's so many people on his panel. But um, he's, he's doing cosmic questions, which is really interesting. And our producer has got some of those um, together. And I put some of those in a big box already. <laughs> wow. box. So they're going to be very deep questions. Um, oh, yes, I've got it now. David Adair is going to be on that as well. Um, and, and, uh, and your friend uh, and mine, um, uh, Jason Quick, is going to be on that panel as well. Yeah, that's a good so, panel. That's a good yeah, panel. And yeah. <clears throat> looking forward and, to that. And then George. And then George does his speaker reception. And uh, award ceremony. Yeah, award ceremony in the afternoon. And, of course, you know, um, David and Corey are going to be doing presentations. Well, David, at least, David Wilcock, has got a pre presentation each day. There's something he's doing each day. So all of David Wilcox's fans can come every <laughs> each of the days, and you'll see them. It's yeah, good. yeah, I'll be introducing <laughs> David and Corey um, at each of those events, and uh -huh. so they're making sure that, that I stay busy, uh, yeah. which, is, which is really, really cool. And then mm -hmm. um, the tell us about that party that is happening oh, Saturday yeah. night. So that party is free, um, by the way, with admission. Um, and, you know, our producer, um, uh, he really wanted it to be Summer of Love, you know, and remembering the Summer of Love, having the music, having experience. Um, and um, so we're all going to hear music, uh, some live music, too, um, a Beatles, a lot of Beatles. And um, Robert Farrell is going to be singing a lot of Beatles songs. Um, and there's a DJ as well. There's videos from those times. And it's the feeling, again, of, of um, you know, love and peace that we had at that time that we thought was going to, well, it did change the world, I think. I yes, think it, it did make a huge did. difference, didn't it? Where, where, where <laughs> is that party going to be at? Um, oh, that's in La Jolla. That's in the La Jolla. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. In the big yeah. room? In the big room, yeah. yeah. That's going to be extraordinary. Uh, yeah. And, um, and I know you're going to be there doing some of the announcements as well. Yep. And, um, yeah, that's why I came to California in the first place, because of the love and peace. I, I was 14. I didn't come when I was 14. I didn't come here till I was 18. But <laughs> I think I thought, well, I really want to go there and just wear flowers and <laughs> just feel the love. So I did eventually come. Who's and I do still wear flowers. Who's doing the uh, keynote on Friday night? On Friday night, because, well, you've got the panel, but after the panel... We didn't want to put any big keynotes, except Carolyn Myth is doing it. Um, is doing, a, you know, um, she's a, a very famous teacher and healer. Um, so she is doing um, a Friday night um, special event. But also, right after Ancient Alien panel, Stephen Bassett's going to do a disclosure event. So we want everyone to be prepared to stay up a bit late and stay. Um, he's going to do a 90-minute presentation and. 
um, you know, it's really important now. Um, some things might be changing since that um, DOD footage came out of the UFOs and the jets. So um, we got him in there right after your, your panel, our ancient alien panel, in the same place in the plaza. So, so that's are you really saying, <clears throat> I want to I wanna understand here. So uh, Friday night, the ancient aliens panel, mm-hmm. that's, that's going to be the, that's the main event going on at that time at Conscious Life Expo? Yes, well, in that in that respect to to those kinds of things, but there's other speakers on healing and and other kinds of you know transformational um, things as well. There's always about four or five speakers at any time at the expo. Right. So we try to get things that are related, um, you know, at separate times. Um, so, do yeah. you know Do you know how packed that panel is going to be on Friday I know. night? How many, I, I, I was just thinking about that. I was imagining, because every year that I host the panel, normally we do it uh, Saturday morning at 5 a.m., right? So, um, <laughs> and, and <laughs> after after the fade or not party, too, I'm going to remind yeah. you of that. So, but anyway, where there's another 30 speakers that are speaking at the same time. But this time around, it's Friday night, prime time in the Plaza Ballroom. Yeah, uh, it's going to yes. be packed. It's going to exactly. be crazy. It's it going to be so it's much fun. Be incredible. Yeah. Um, now, how many uh, how many people attend the Conscious Life Expo each year? Um, well, I've heard it's been because I don't count them myself. Between twelve thousand to fifteen thousand. Um, and of course, they're coming over the whole weekend. You know, um, that, that's not necessarily that they're all there at once because you've got those, those three days, and then you've got postcon on Monday. So, and be- some people come from one day. You know, <laughs> between twelve and fifteen thousand. Yeah, yeah. Do you know that's that is an insane number? I know, <laughs> but it yeah. feel it feels like it because if, first off, the LAX Hilton is ginormous. This is not, mm-hmm. I mean, all you know, it's a big hotel. Well, this this is a ginormous hotel. It's 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 huge. Yeah. But when you walk through there and you start to see what's really going on, you can tell that there are literally thousands and thousands of people there for this event, all with with open hearts and minds. Yes, yes, like big family, really big family. And you it's see, so nice. you know, you know what, you know what I like to do. Uh, I want, I want to hear you laugh. <laughs> I love, I love it when I, I like to people watch. Right, it's my favorite thing. Yeah, yeah. And if you really, well, I mean, the the beautiful thing about Southern California, and and this event is, you will get your handful of really fun people to look at. <laughs> right? Yes, like, you do. Check <laughs> out that dude. Right? And, <laughs> right. And, yeah, I it, know. It's so awesome because... There really could be yeah, some aliens there. There yeah, could be some aliens. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Because your, your ego was checked at the door. And that's what's <laughs> most important. Your ego is checked at the door. It's just all about having a good time. So anyway, what I was going to say was, <laughs> so you have this enormous amount of people and then you you don't realize it until you walk um, around, like you walk into the vendor room and you turn the corner and there's two, three thousand people in there. And you're yeah. like, oh, holy crap. I thought that I thought that was everybody outside. Then you see that. <laughs> then you go across the hall to uh, the food area. Right. And there's another yeah. thousand people. And then you walk upstairs and you start to uh, venture around with the uh, um the lecture halls, and you see a line of a thousand people waiting to go in to see somebody speak, and yeah. you're like, "Where are all the it's this?" And then, and that's not even the end of it. Then you go downstairs to right. that vendor area into the plaza ballroom, and there's another few thousand people down there. It is an enormous event, a huge undertaking. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we, that's why we work on it all year, but we love it, and it's great that you can be part of it. Fantastic, and you're going to have a great spot up on the mezzanine there when you're not busy doing something else. Yeah. With and, the coffee as well. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. We're there with River Moon Coffee, uh, yeah. everybody, right at the top of the stairs. Uh, when you check in, we'll be right there in the mezzanine area. 
But also, uh, we have New Pharma is going to be there, one of our sponsors, uh, Chip Paul. Yeah. And yeah. Ronnie McMullen is going to be there from Life Change Tea. And and their booths are right next to each other. Uh, we arranged that. So mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. could, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, it's really cool. Fade to Black uh, has got footprints all over. And we are partners mm-hmm. in this with you. And we just really enjoy this conference. It's it's one of the great events all year long, and and we're very excited about it. I cannot believe, I'm serious, I cannot yeah. believe we're just a week away. It's like we go yeah. to bed tonight, and we wake up and, and go to the show. It's going to be so much fun. Now, yeah. is uh, Doug uh, is Doug going to be set up, too, as well, with his artwork? Yes, he is. He's going to be also on the mezzanine, where he usually is, not far from where you are. Right, right. So he'll have his art. And he just did something new with Gobekli Tepe and a UFO. And I, I think I sent it to you on Messenger, but you might not have seen it. Oh, no, so, I haven't seen it. Yeah, really? He did a yeah. Gobekli Tepe painting. Yeah. It's actually sort of using the photo of it and superimposing UFO and light. And, oh, it's really interesting. And, he, and he's going to bring it to the expo, but it's also for the, um, you know, the other conference, the um, the. Um, alien conference, alien con later in the year as well. <laughs> right, right. Uh, the question is, am I in that painting? Oh, you have to be in that painting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got to talk to Doug. <laughs> I, I got to yeah. talk to Doug. So um, now, and and plenty of food, and and all of that is is a go go. Um, are there still rooms available at the Hilton? Oh. Um, I think there were. We had to open out some more rooms with the, our producer. He was telling me that he had to go and, and get some more because they all sold. Right. So I think he did. Okay. So hopefully. Okay. Well, <laughs> Better I, hurry. <laughs> I, I cannot wait. It, it's going to be a sensational event. And, and again, from Rita and I and everybody here at Fade to Black, you know, to the team there, to T and you and Diana and, of course, Q, uh, and the effort that you, everybody, the staff over there, puts mm. uh, into this event. It is a premier event, and I, I, cannot, I cannot wait for next weekend. Thank you so much, Serena. Thank you, and don't forget live stream. Everyone can watch on live stream all over the world. That's right, and the, yeah. and the live stream options are right there at Conscious Life Expo. Somebody was just tweeting about that a few minutes ago. Oh, great. All <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Serena. Okay, thank we'll, you. We'll see, see you in there. a week. You got it. Yeah. Bye bye. Serena Wright Taylor, Conscious Life Expo. It is just one week away. It is a tremendous event. And with that, let's kick off Fader Night. I'll be right back with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom, followed by open lines all night long 323 825 or 323 You can follow me on Twitter at JChurch Radio. That's simple. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. It's Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. I'll be right back with John Rappaport. Stay with us. Listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Fade to black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights. Just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. 
Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. Natural Health Solutions with Chris and Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie, how you doing? Great, Chris. Now you're the CEO of GetTheTea.com, right? Yes, I am. What is GetTheTea.com? I mean, is this tea you buy in a store? Well, no, it's not. Life Change Tea is just that, life changing. Life Change Tea is an herbal tea that gently cleanses your body from intruders. What do you mean by intruders? Well, intruders are toxins, chemicals, GMOs, heavy metals, and more. They're in our food, in our water, in our air we breathe. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. And Life Change Tea will help you with removing these, as you say, intruders? That's right, Chris. Are there side effects with this tea? Well, you might lose a little weight. When you clean your colon, you lose weight, you feel better, and you have more energy. Wow. Ronnie, where can people purchase Life Change Tea? Oh, that's easy. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Ronnie, I want to thank you for being on the show. People, don't forget, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA. The planet. Win big with KGRA this summer. Tickets and hotel accommodations to the biggest conferences. Autographed books and DVDs. Chances to win all-inclusive conference cruises. And private dinners with your favorite KGRA hosts. Click the contest tab at KGRARadio.com for your chance to win big this summer. Your contact for the best alternative talk radio on the planet. KGRARadio.com Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Bassett, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. And now, coming to you from the No More Fake News Room in Deep Space, which is the space that we suspect to be true, that the world as it is fed to us every day by the Ministry of Truth is a lie. A false reality. A movie on the screen of our subconscious. This, however, is the breakout. All the screens crash. They all go down and we see the light of day. A new day. No more robots. No more androids. It's the No More Fake News Room with John Rappaport. Take it away, John. Thank you, Jimmy. Good to be here, as always, folks. So tonight I want to talk about media news reality new reality because as everybody knows and as I've talked about a number of times on the show independent media has been on the rise in fact it's been on the rise to such a degree that sometimes we lose track of the advance of many, many, many independent sources of news. When I started out as a reporter in 1982, uh, I wrote an article for LA Weekly, which was a free newspaper, still is, in Los Angeles. It was bankrolled by a few people it became extremely popular in Los Angeles uh, in the early 80s and moving forward. Uh, there were a few reasons for that. One was it had a calendar of local events that was like no other. Everything, music, theater, film, what have you very very extensive and the film reviews were written by very sharp people and uh, LA Weekly helped to invigorate and in a way revolutionize the film business because they were giving a lot of space to new filmmakers independent filmmakers who would get their films shown in small theaters in Los Angeles there was no internet, of course. There were no cell phones. 
There was no social media. Independent newspapers, of which there were very few, and a few independent magazines, and that was basically it for independent media, certainly in the United States. Eventually, I started giving lectures in bookstores, different venues around Los Angeles, and uh, this would take me up to the sort of early to mid-1990s. And there was a group called She Who Remembers, great name, husband and wife team, that would come to my lectures and lectures delivered by other people around Los Angeles. And they would tape them as they were happening. And they had about five or six tape copiers, cassette copiers right there. And they would sell the cassettes after the lecture. And these cassettes would get out there. They would travel. People would make copies. Some would end up in Europe, Asia, who knows. It was a real underground of independent information. Now, of course, look at what we have. It's quite unbelievable when you really step back and look at it. Major media news is panicking and has been for some time, in part because online is not giving them the income that they want. So they can't really make a whole lot of money online. But online is the wave. It's the new wave. That's only part of the reason. The other reason is because people are waking up to the fact and have been for some time that there are many different viewpoints on what's happening in the world and in fact what reality is, how far it potentially extends in all directions that is not recognized by major media and more and more people are interested in it radio shows like this one, other radio shows, YouTube videos. When I first started uh, No More Fake News in uh, 2001, videos were not happening online. Not really. That's all changed. Bloggers. There was the word blog didn't exist to any degree that I was aware of when I started No More Fake News. The whole landscape has completely changed, and with it, people's view of reality. So that we're talking about a reality shift here, not just politically or economically, but on every level that you can imagine. And I want to give you an example of it. So I've gone to a website. I've got it up on my screen. It's called blacklistednews.com. It's an aggregate, independent aggregate news site. They post articles from all over the place. And I'm just going to read some headlines. And I, if you can, uh, depending on how old you are, just think back to, say, 15 years ago and see whether you would find headlines like this in the news. This is a fairly popular site. It's not one of the two or three or four biggest aggregate news sites, but it's getting there. So listen, I'm just going to read the headlines, and in a few cases I'll read, uh, you know, a paragraph. California overreacts and presumes every homeschooling parent is a child abuser. I'm going to read a little bit of this. California is seeking to treat homeschool families as presumptive child abusers. Lawmakers in that state have indicated plans to categorically require homeschool parents to prove through home visits, interviews, and other government oversight that indeed... 
the parent is not abusive if they choose to exercise a legally protected and valid option for school choice, meaning homeschooling. This measure would shift the burden to the parent to prove to the government's satisfaction his or her parental fitness. That's a big story. Headline, Virginia appears poised to approve cannabis oil as a medical treatment. Here's an article of my own. Federal control of fluoridation would be a nightmare. Prison labor is a billion-dollar industry with uncertain returns for inmates. CDC head forced to resign after she's caught buying shares in vaccine and big tobacco companies. Immigrants sent $140 billion from U.S. back to homelands in 2016. Cops raid licensed chef's home, steal his cooking equipment for feeding the homeless. Apple, Verizon, continue to lobby against the right to repair your own devices. In role reversal, drug dealers take the stand at criminal trial of Baltimore police officers. Amazon uh, patents wristband that tracks warehouse workers' movements. Clark County defies order to release Vegas shooter coroner's report. Owner files $1 million lawsuit after being forced to decapitate dog. Apparently that force was applied by police. Now, some of these stories would appear. This is just, you know, one day's headlines here. Some of these stories would appear in major media, but some definitely would not. This does not sound like the news of 15 years ago. Major shifts are occurring and even major media are being forced to follow. So what does this mean? When you're in the middle of a reality or paradigm shift, quite often it's difficult to see it happening. You sense that something is changing, but you're not sure what it is. Well, one of the major paradigm shifts in this world now is the nature of news and how it's being discovered and how it's being reported and who's reporting it. And yes, there are many independent news sites that uh, you might look at and say, well, I'm not interested in that. I think it's all biased and prejudiced and whatever. Sure. Okay, fine. But then there are maybe 100,000 other independent news sites (laughs) where that wouldn't be the case. And more and more people are getting their news from independent media, which means their view of reality is changed and is continuing to change. (laughs) This is, you know, major stuff here to become aware of, right? If reality is changing, where is it going to go? What's going to happen? I remember that one of the things I used to lecture about in uh, Los Angeles and other places back in the, let's say, I don't know, early 1990s was the decentralization of power. And I pointed out that even then there was beginning to be a trend to decentralize power in the media, in news. But I had no possible clue that it was going to 
uh, explode in the way that it, it has. Decentralization of power changes reality. You sitting there listening to Fade to Black, <clears throat> you are plugging into reality at a completely different level. The reports that you're listening to, the interviews that Jimmy does, the guests, night after night after night, attracting huge numbers of people all over the planet. This is not merely uh, entertainment, folks. This is changing the reality inside people's skulls. That's what's happening. And we have to or should think about where is this going to go? And my view on this for a very long time now has been that as power decentralizes and as more and more individuals form their own uh, fluid view of reality that we are entering into a new phase in civilization and society regardless of what else is happening in government in education in medicine wherever you want to look and that is that the individual is coming forth again as being a vital factor in the world because we're seeing much less homogenized reality than we were before. How far is this going to go in say the next 50 years? Well, I can tell you for sure that the planners, the technocrats, are looking at this phenomenon and what are they trying to figure out? They're trying to figure out how they can put the lid back on the pot. They're trying to figure out how they can somehow bring people back to a monolithic consensus about reality. This goes way further than, quote, the news. They're trying to build consensus that's already crumbling. Consensus about what is real and what is not real. This is the shift that we're in the middle of. Now, this is not an orderly change. People have to get used to that. This is not the kind of thing where people say, well, this is what we can predict next year and two years from now, and here's how it's going to play it. No, 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 no. This is just the opposite of that. It's going to be a bumpy ride in a lot of ways. And we're not looking up the road at one new reality that is going to be uh, shared by everybody. So the people who say, yes, we're going into a new reality, a big paradigm shift, and so we're all going to end up at X. And what I'm saying is that is not what is going to happen. That's just a kind of replacement theory saying one form of brainwashing is going to be replaced by another, a better one, you know, which a lot of people get sucked into. They want to say, 
now that we've gotten rid of that horrid old reality, let's all join together in a new reality. And I'm saying, sure, if you want to try that, you can, but that's not the change that's going on here. That's not the root of what's happening. What's happening is you are making, discovering, inventing your reality. And you over there, you're doing it for yourself. And many, 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 many people are doing that. Where does that leave us? Or where will that leave us? Some people say, well, that's a terrible thing because we'll all be sort of like uh, atoms separately floating in space. We'll be isolated from each other, blah, 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 blah. Really? Is that guaranteed that that's the way it'll be? We're looking at a new metaphysic here that's emerging. And what I'm suggesting is that it's going to be so decentralized 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now that people are going to find new ways to reach across the space and gap between their reality and somebody else's reality, which could be quite different, quite different. And that's going to be extremely interesting. How do you do that? Well, there is no formula. You do it however you can. You figure it out. That's going to become a very interesting challenge, let's call it. How do you do that? Because that's where we're heading. And along the way, yes, there are going to be sort of group consciousnesses forming, you know, because people are afraid to decentralize too much. So they're going to stop at a very friendly looking restaurant in the psychic, uh, you know, voyage and say, oh, there's a lot of people here and I like them. So let me settle in here because maybe this will be where I'll make my new uh, psychic home. And they'll stay for a while and then they'll become dissatisfied with that because it begins to resemble the old sort of uh, mind control uh, strategy of major uh, reality makers and they'll drift away from that. But I don't think that it's going to be all that isolating. I think it's going to be very exciting because you're going to have many, 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 many more people who have uh, established their own pictures, their own sensations, their own ideas, their own reality. It's going to become uh, imbued, strengthened in many, many, many individuals. And then when they connect in the ways that they connect, there, there's that interesting challenge. How do we reach across the gap and make a connection? And when we do, it's going to be more authentic than it was. So rather than looking at the future as building towards some uh, unity where everybody, you know, melts down into one fabulous uh, cheese glob. I believe the real trend is in the opposite direction. Decentralize, decentralize, decentralize. Find your own reality. Dig into that reality. Discover more about it. Find information that pertains to it. 
If you don't like where you settle in, make another change. Find a better reality, your own in each case. This is an underlying undertow, so to speak, that's happening. The propagandists and the planners and the technocrats are aware of it and they are trying everything they can through social media, through whatever means, many means, to uh, build a fence around it. And it's not working. And it's going to continue not to work. We are heading toward a reality of millions of different realities. Contemplate that. That's my report for tonight. You know, a little little scary. No, it's a lot scary, John. But why why has this developed? It started, you know, a couple of decades ago and it started to fragment out and fragment out and fragment out. Today, clearly, that is the agenda. You know, and I have to ask, why? Is it so they can divide and conquer dissension amongst the troops? No, I, I think that what, at least what I'm talking about is this is happening at the root. This is not just, uh, you could say, okay, well, there's a program to try to just sort of atomize everybody and Right. Separate them from each other. Sure. Okay. But I think that the real version of this is happening within individuals. This is not a plan from above. And, this and, is where we're going. And and I, I had mentioned this a couple of weeks ago that it seems like everybody is ready to do this. Like it's part of our DNA. Nobody's fighting it. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I think that I think that when you peel off enough layers of the onion, this is what people begin to realize that, you know, hey, this is why I'm here to develop my own, you know, reality and not to just go along with the, the consensus. Right, right. And it's fascinating to me where it it, it is it, it's been almost like I said, it's been building up for a long time. Uh, uh, but now with electronic media, multimedia, now it, it and, and the internet and social media, that this very fundamental germ is inside of all of us, and it is it is just visible now. You know what I mean? It's just like right in front of us. I I, I believe that to be absolutely true. I see that happening all the time, and I think other people do too. You know, and like I said, it's not, it's a bumpy ride uh, because you can get easily discouraged and say, well, gee, I don't like this and whatever, but it, it's going to go on anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it, it may not be as comfortable as life seemed to be in the 1950s right. when conformity was the name of the game, but the dividends that pay off in the long run are quite fantastic they are they are the the days of conformity think about it leave it to beaver right yeah okay leave it to beaver that was the atomic fa the nuclear fa right that that was what was supposed to be going on in every house in the united states that and and those days those days are so far gone and so far removed and now the the individual that that thing that fragmented thing is here and it's only going to it's only going to grow but it also it, it this divide and conquer thing is going on with that i i i'm i'm fascinated with what is happening i'm i'm just fascinated with this me too me too it is fascinating it's jo uh you know it's incredible. It, it, it truly is. Truly is. By the way, uh, we did go and watch Network last week after the show. Mm. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, we may have to cover that again, uh, you and I, on a future show, just the two of us. And let's break that thing down. That would be great. We could do that scene by scene. Scene by scene, my friend. Thank you so much, John. Be safe out there.
You too, Jimmy. Thanks. John Rappaport. And again, start your day every day on his nomorefakenews.com. Absolutely incredible. John Rappaport. All right, let's kick it off. Thursday night, it is Fader Night. Open lines all night long, 323-825-5045 or 323-275-9695. This is Fade to Black. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, Fader Knots. This is Jimmy Church, and I'm introducing New Pharma, a company whose products are based on science. Human function based on the endocannabinoid system, or ECS. New Pharma firmly believes in this science, and their research indicates that support of the ECS provides the beneficial effects for a healthy lifestyle. New Pharma's science includes relief capsules for pain relief, sleep capsules, which are natural support for occasional sleeplessness, Foundation is support for your ECS, and Fit Capsules support your active lifestyle. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2B for a 33% discount on all of their products. Or visit NewPharma.com for all of the knowledge on the science. That's G-N-U-Pharma.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Ancient Life Oil. Life changing. The real oil. CBD is truly ancient life oil from the source. This oil has no psychoactive effect and is also legal in all 50 states. When you're healthy, you're happy. The truth about this wonderful plant is that it wants to give back to mankind life, longevity, and happiness. Ancient life oil are golden grade, all organic, non GMO, and infused with high quality liquid coconut oil. It's simple. Just go to ancient ancientlifeoil.com today that's ancientlifeoil.com the best purest organic and non-gmo cbd in the world go back lee tappy the statements made regarding these products have not been evaluated by the food and drug administration these products are not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease please consult your healthcare professional about potential interactions or other possible complications before using any product This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Thank you, John Rappaport. No more fake newsroom live. Unreal. All right. It's Thursday night. It's Fader night. Open lines all night long. 323-825-5045 or 323-275-9695. If you're on hold, stay right there. I'll start to uh, get to calls in a second. But I wanted to uh, get to a few things that I always start off every show with, and uh, and that is this. Happy birthday to today. Michael C. Hall of Dexter, six feet under, is 46 years old. And our dead guy's birthday today 
is Rick James. 1948 to 2004, died at the age of 56. His albums, Come and uh, Come Get It and Street Songs, influenced so many. I can't tell you. Street Songs in uh, my house back in Indianapolis that I shared with Bruce Pfeiffer. And if he's listening tonight, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. We played that album um, <laughs> back to back to back every night for a summer. And uh, and he also produced Tina Marie, the Mary Jane Girls, Temptations, Eddie Murphy, Smokey Robinson. But he also went to prison for kidnapping. Never got over his drug use. And on the morning of August 6th, 2004, he was found dead in his apartment at the Oakwoods in uh, Burbank, uh, right down the street here. And he had so many drugs in his bloodstream. I can't even pronounce these drugs. He had Alprazolam diazepam, burpo, pre, burpo, burpoprian, I don't know, citalopram, uh, hydrocodone, uh, digoxin, uh, chlorphenamarine, I don't even know, methamphetamine and cocaine all in his blood. I, I'm not a doctor. I can't pronounce those uh, Latin terms. But nonetheless, uh, he influenced so many, and he's up there right now. Happy birthday, Rick James. On this day in history, OTD, the space shuttle, yes, Rita, really, the space shuttle, OTD, 2003, the space shuttle Columbia breaks up while entering the atmosphere over Texas, killing all crew, all seven crew members aboard. And our fader fact today, instead of a foreign office, the Roman Empire had a bureau of barbarians, and that is our fader fact. That's That was their foreign office. Kind of reminds you of the United States today. All right, let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hi, Jimmy. It's Bev. Hey, Bev. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm fantastic. It's Thursday night. It's fader night, Bev. Yep. What's on your mind? Well, I agree with, you know, John, you know, but the, the government needs to just lay off. You know, stay out of our lives raising kids. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. The answer they, is they, yes, yes, got enough, They got enough control over our lives. Why should they tell us how to raise our kids? Well, um, uh, hang on for a second. Um, okay. is, is that there's, there's two aspects to that. One is yours. The second one though, is I, if I had a crystal ball, Bev, I would have our schools more involved with our kids' lives. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we've lost, we've lost track of that. You know, yep. we've we've lost track because I used to be, um, and I don't want to sound like I'm the old guy in the room here, but I used to be scared of my teachers, right? Yeah. I was oh, yeah. I was scared of the school principal. You didn't want to go to the principal's office. You didn't want, you know, th these were things that were fundamental in our lives, and it was part mm -hmm. of uh, growing up was the respect in school. So in that aspect... Um, I, I, I wish that we had more uh, involvement in our children's lives because today uh, the teachers got zero respect. I mean, in, well, in most schools. And I remember, and I'm sure you do too, that if you, back when we were in school, we had corporal punishment. That's right. And if you got that at school when you got home, you got it again. And, and you know, when it came to corporal punishment, um, today there is such a, a, a stigma on that. And mm -hmm. But if I went home and, and said to my dad or mom that I got whacked today by the teacher <laughs> in school, their response would be, well, you probably ask for it. Yep. Right? Yep. I, I didn't, my, my dad wasn't going to go to the school the next day and kick down the front door and threaten a lawsuit. Nope. That's nope. Nope. I, and, and second, and the other part is, I probably wouldn't tell my parents that I got whacked. No. 
Does that no, mean, but, that means I deserved it? I did something in school, yeah. and 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 let's just keep that between the school and me, and and not admit but, this to my parents. And that's really the truth. And, um, and see, our our school. Well, when we were in school, I know I'm I'm older than you are, but when we were in school, if we got corporal punishment, then the school would call our parents and let them know. And then, oh boy! Yeah, then you got in trouble. And when we got home, <laughs> then you got in trouble a second time. Yeah. Now, yep. and, <laughs> and and again, I, I see we are in such a politically correct world right now. Oh, it's that, sickening. Yeah, that these words that I'm saying are probably offensive to a younger generation out there, or you know that I I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I do know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. And I'm not some damaged individual. I wasn't a damaged no. kid when it happened. You know, and yeah. that's that's it. And, you know, in a weird way, it was kind of fun. It was kind of cool. All right. You know, uh, you walked into a classroom and a teacher had their paddle up on the chalkboard right mm-hmm. there looking at you. You know, oh, so. and it had holes in it. It oh. had holes in it. Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, Ooh. hey, Bev, thank you so much for the phone call. Be safe and be be well and give my best to Bob. Okay, I sure would not want to let you know. Yes. I get my uh, glasses. I got my glasses on. Oh, man, we lost Bev just like that. Wow, that was weird. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Jimmy, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Hey, man, this is Steve. I'm in Oregon. Uh, I used to be, I lived in Louisiana. That's where the accent's from. But, uh, hey, man. I'm going to have to skip out on the Conscious Life Expo this weekend. Oh, man, too bad. But I've already got my early bird tickets to contact in the desert. That's what I'm talking uh, about. Cool. uh, Yeah, and uh, I'm just trying to, like, you know, go ahead and plan out a little bit of uh, ahead. And I was just curious to, you know, like, there's a lot of stuff going on at night. Is everybody camping out, or what's the deal? Um, I spoke to them about that. Now, there's go to the – you've been to the website. Um, yes. See if there is camping there. We were talking about that over the weekend, and I can't remember, Steve. Uh, I don't want to sound dumb right now, but I'm feeling dumb. It's still hard. Yeah, we just talked about it, and there was a conversation. So I know that there is camping. Um, so there's got to be something on their website about it. Is that what you want to do? So many people do. Well, yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking camping, uh, probably try to get me some of those green balls between now and then, uh, right. And, and, uh, you know, just hanging out and having fun at night because I'm not much of a sleeper when there's excitement going on. And there will be a lot of it, uh, for sure. I I mean, yeah, the resort is is really nice, really cool. I know that there's some camping uh, right next door, close by. I don't know if okay. they have it on site uh, like they did over in Joshua Tree. But um, what's really cool about that part of the desert is the night vision and what goes on there at night is extraordinary. So you're going to have a great time, and you know uh, the Fader Knots will be grouping together and as we get closer to contact in the desert, there will be a lot of conversation about it. So you'll know you'll know where the events are happening and and where everybody is getting together. Uh, so Jimmy, let me uh, just say one thing about uh, the disclosure and what's been going on recently. Uh, I was a medic in the army for six years, and uh, so throughout my like time in the uh the army i got to play around with a lot of cool toys right because everybody liked to give doc you know like the biggest gun they could find or with the coolest new gas you know gadget or whatever and i can tell you that looking up at the night sky with night vision goggles on is uh it, it's totally a game changer and uh Anybody that can actually get their hands on a tool like that is uh, very lucky. 
Yeah, it's uh, we the company that we work with, uh, Bearing Optics. Uh, we have our night vision events every year. We we do it a few times a year at different uh, conferences around the country. And and the first time that I did it, which was four years ago, I had heard about it and heard about it. I've seen the videos and I had heard about it, but you don't understand. The, what what goes on when you do the night vision is this, and it's very simple. You look up into the sky with your eyeballs like you've done every night for your life, right? You're used to seeing. And then you, th- you look through the night vision, and then you take a look, and you see things. You pull the night vision down, and you look. This is what everybody does the first time. Then you pull the night vision down, and you're looking, and you're like, wait a minute. And then you go back to the night vision, and you're like, holy crap. That's what's going on up there right now, and you hear everybody yelling and and screaming, and then you start to uh, uh, look at what everybody else is looking at, and you are seeing, and then you pull the night vision, and it's not there. It's crazy to go through, Um, and it it is truly a game changer. It's an epiphany. It's a life-changing event. I'm just curious, though, like, if you and I can look up at the night sky just like a couple of days, you know, in the last couple of days with the super moon, seeing the crazy, you know, like orb lighting up the sky. All right. We can look at the sky and see that there are UAPs, UFOs, call it whatever you want. But what are we going to, what do you think, even if they came out and said the White House, like land on the lawn, I, I get that, but what do you think our government is actually going to do for us by disclosing aliens or whatever you want to call it? Well, um, I, this is, it, there's about 50 ways to answer that question, but this is what I think. This is my personal take, okay? And my personal take is if they are disclosing like they did, you know, this this thing that happened on December 16th. If they are disclosing, then is it because they need to get out in front of something else that's about to break and ease the blow, right? Ease the blow to us. Um, or is there something else going on that they cannot control? That, and, and Stephen Greer brought that up well, last night. We already know that. Yeah. So, you know, what what what's the real reason? I, you know what? As things uh uh continue, um ho- hold on for a second, Steve. If things continue well, hey, like, think, if if things continue like they are, then those questions are going to get answered for us. You know, if they continue like they are, we're going to find out exactly what is going on. And uh okay, got it, Rita. Yes, I'm I'm up and running. Um, I'm sorry about that, Steve. Uh, our computers no, cool, one of man. our one of our computer systems uh, just crashed and is is back online. I'm letting Rita know. So, but uh, hey, Vinny, yeah. I got one more question for you. Sure. Okay. Do you think that the rock stardom that some of the uh, members of the community Kind of, you know, I mean, we all got to have our matriarchs, our patriarchs, whatever you want to call it. But sometimes I feel like their information is, you know, not always bringing something new to the table. And before I go, you know, like spending a whole bunch of money on these uh, extra stuff for the conferences and stuff like that, you know, I, Jimmy, I'm just curious as like, some of my favorite speakers, you know, like are some of the more uh, lesser known members of the community. And, you know, like Dr. Greer last night came on and I mean, he's, I haven't seen a whole lot from him lately. And, but last night I didn't really hear anything new from him. Well, and, yeah, and, and, and Steve, you bring up a great point, and, um, and thank you for the phone call, by the way. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm going to say this. One of the things that we try to do here at Fade to Black uh, constantly is we try to have first-time guests, 
And if you go back and you look at uh, our schedule and you look at the guests that we have brought on over the last four going on five years, uh, so many are first-time guests. That's why I do the first-time guest disclaimer to remind everybody of of somebody that is is new, uh, not only to Fade to Black, but hopefully to our audience. So we're always pushing for that. Also, um, with uh, Conscious Life Expo and Contact in the Desert, one of the things that they are doing, and they they talk to us about this all the time. Okay, who is new? Who is it? Who it? You know, and and Rita uh, and I are in constant touch with uh, these conferences to suggest somebody new. Somebody that's got uh, uh, fresh information coming forward and uh, that is is bright and is connected and is in touch. And I'm here to tell you, wait till you see who we have on Monday's show on Fade to Black, right? First time guest. So um, it, we, we are constantly pushing for that, and so are those conferences, okay? And, and Steve, and the other thing is with those conferences, there are – Certain speakers that people want to see. They want to see George Henry. They want to see Sukalos. They want to see Linda Moulton Howe and David Wilcock. They want to see those, uh, you know, uh, Eric Von Daniken. There are, uh, you know, Richard Dolan. These are very, very important people and researchers to uh, the community. And it, it's a festive uh, atmosphere that that is going on, and you need that part of it too. Absolutely. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hey, Jimmy. This is Eric in Denver, Colorado. Hey, Eric in Denver, Colorado. How are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I was in the shower when that uh, first lady was on uh, talking about. Uh, the presentation at uh, Conscious Life Expo uh, concerning consciousness and UFOs. And I had a thought hit me while that was going on. What's that? And that is, um, well, you've got uh, ESETI and some places in Sedona that offer tours and viewing and using the optics that you are all familiar with. But I know that in general, um, it is quite common to ask these craft as they appear to fire up or turn or something of, uh, to that effect. And I was wondering, I I'm, I'm, don't have the experience myself, and so I'm not really sure if I'm on the right track. If When you're thinking that and you're asking, in effect, uh, to control the craft or ask it to do something at a request, maybe – just maybe consciously through your own thinking, you are at that point piloting those craft yourself, and they are allowing it. Uh, fan, unbelievable thought. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. Is that possible? I, uh, you know, why wouldn't it be? I mean, that's the thing. Well, why Why wouldn't it be? There is uh, a certain amount of, uh, uh, of happiness, of things that are going on at that moment uh, when, and suddenly they seem to be appearing. And I have, uh, I have said this, uh, I don't know why it happens the way that it does, right? I don't know. Because we have a certain amount of accidents that happen. You're driving down the road, you see something in the sky. Uh, a couple of nights ago, outside, boom, something appears. And those are accidents. You know, Black Triangle cruises by. Th that's a, a one-time thing, right? But when you get a group of people together and you all are asking for this to happen and then suddenly for the next two or three hours... Things are zipping by. Things are lighting up. Things are winking and saying hello, and it's blue, and it's red, and it's orange, and it's yellow, and 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 this is happening. You have to stop and ask yourself, is it because we, are, we want this to occur? Is it happening because we are inviting them down? You know, now, well, now taking it to the next level of us controlling that craft, uh, wouldn't it almost be the same thing? 
Almost. Well, that that's when another related thought at the same time hit me. Uh, also, something common practice in these places that you go to to experience this. I'm not saying necessarily that you have to go to these places to experience this. I think that this is available and is presented to you, as you just said, uh, as an opportunity. When you see craft, I think that is an opportunity to become, at that point, a pilot or co-pilot. Right. But you can go to these places. So, in effect, by going to these places, you're already prepping your mind with expectation, with a sort of premeditative state, and you're visualizing somewhat what you are expecting to see. And by doing that, you've set aside fear. You've put that aside. So it is not a fearful thing. It is something that is exciting, and you've become focused, and you're you're very narrow-minded on a particular subject matter and dialed in. Sure. And so when sure. you alleviated that fear through this practice, you are now have set up yourself to, I mean, we all know that physics, quantum physics tells us there's not really any distance because we have spooky action at a distance. So right, right. parallel things like things happen. Right. Point A, point simultaneously. Well, remove the distance. You're in effect already in the pilot seat. You're just consciously assuming the role of being the pilot with your thought and preparation. And perhaps when we see craft that seem random, maybe that's just creation or universe, kind of letting you know that you're ready. Now fly it. Well, and let me, yes, yes. And and this is what is really cool about what you are saying here. And I think that you are spot on the money. And I'll tell you why. The, the, the connection of mind, of consciousness between us and them, they understand. We're, we, we're getting close to that, but they do it. And, and I'll give you a perfect example of that where it's not random. Four years ago, Rita and I had uh, this, rented this uh, cabin uh, thing out in the middle of the desert, right? And we Mm -hmm. got the, we got the fader knots together. And when we did that, and Eric, I want to thank you for the phone call, by the way. Okay, thank you for that. And um, uh, we, I, I'm, I've got to get to this other call that's coming in, Eric. So let me grab this. We've been waiting for this call, sure. so let me let me grab this. But I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question, and it's this: We were out. Uh, we rented this cabin in the middle of the desert. And when we did that, we invited over uh, maybe a dozen friends, and we're out in the middle of the desert. And and so we had Steve Murillo there from MUFON. We had Alex Mistretta there, the author, um, and maybe uh, 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 10 other people. That, But that part doesn't matter. We were out on the patio, and at that moment— Somebody says, and we're just, you know, we had a, we had a dozen pizzas stacked up, you know, we had, you know, we're drinking and beer and whatever, uh, vodka shots. And, but we were in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing around us. It was just brush and desert and the mountains in the background, no lights, nothing like that. And somebody says, wouldn't it be cool if, uh, you know, if a UFO just popped up and at that moment, and I was facing <laughs> facing out from the cabin, at that moment, out in the middle of the desert, this white ball. Now, if there wasn't a dozen people there as witnesses, it's just a story. But this is what happened. This white ball pew, shoots up out of the middle of the desert. No smoke, no lights, no trail, no nothing. Just this white glowing ball. It lasted for about two seconds. Went from the desert floor in a perfect straight line, straight up to the stars and disappeared into the atmosphere. (laughs) We were dumbstruck. I was like, did that just happen? And we're all just watching it just disappear into the black. Went straight up into the stars. And it was like one two, three, gone. 
Now, I can't explain that. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was us or them or or some strange interdimensional American Indian entity. I don't know. But it happened. And that's what the crazy part is. All right, let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Yeah, this is Richard Doty. How are you doing, Jimmy? Hey, Richard. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. You sound amazing. You sound perfectly. You sound like you're here in the studio underground. <laughs> Richard. Well, good. You got a good connection. Richard Doty. Okay. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, as you, you I'm, well, I'm going to say this to you. I'm completely surprised by this, and you already know that. Um, so there you go. But Richard, you've been talked about a lot on this show uh, over the years. Uh, what, what are you up to these days? Well, I'm, um, I'm just working for, uh, a couple different, uh, producers and trying to get some things, uh, produced, uh, and on the air, uh, doing some ad- advising mostly, uh, with, uh, a particular producer. I can't, I can't discuss who, but, and I can't discuss really the project, but, We've been working a lot in Nevada, uh, filming. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we filmed uh, um, th- uh, two, three days in Nevada, and uh, just different sites in Nevada for a, an upcoming uh, series. So, Richard, is it okay if we speak freely? Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, I know that. I know that you know that I know that you know <laughs> about about <laughs> your about your history in the past and and uh, the the information the stories and so forth and and video uh, and interviews and 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 information and and stuff. It, it's been in the UFO community for a very 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 long time, and there are those out there, myself included that uh, when we go through uh, your part of of our history, you know, our collective history, that there is a very disturbing part of it that makes us, you know, feel a little uncomfortable, a little dirty, and, and myself included. Um, and you were, you were right in the middle of that heated, heated uh, uh, area. Looking back... Um, and we can we can certainly talk about anything that you would like to talk about now. But today, do you feel any any guilt, or would you go back and change anything when it comes to uh, Benowitz or the way that things went down, or was it just your job in the Air Force and you were just doing what you were told? Well, going back to uh, those days in the eighties. Uh, I had a job to do. I was sanctioned to do certain things, certain missions, uh, based on a, uh, a, a larger plan. Uh, and there were, and, and first of all, let me let, let me say that I wasn't the only person involved in this. There was a 122 other uh, agents that were uh, doing what I was doing, investigating uh, an phenomena, uh, UFO sightings, UFO incidents. That, involving Air Force or uh, occurring on uh, Air Force installations or in the vicinity Air Force installations. Right. And so when we go back to the Benowitz incident or Benowitz uh, operation, uh, I did what I was told to do. I was, I mean, it was, I was uh, given a mission and I did my mission, but uh, a lot of what, what is, is, is uh, spread in the internet uh, isn't factual. Uh, they, 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 I, I know I, I heard somebody on um, coast to coast some some months ago talking about it, saying how I brainwashed Paul Benowitz and, well, if anyone knew Paul Benowitz, he was a very, a strict, uh, down to earth type of person, and he was his own personality. If you can understand what that means, he has his he had his own thought pattern and own uh, own reasoning so i couldn't have convinced him to do something that he didn't want to do 
I never had to convince him to do anything during this operation. He, he was, he was convinced that he was in contact with extraterrestrials. All I had to do was go along with what he said. And we did with me and some others. We just said, you know, Paul, if you think that's an extraterrestrial you have on that screen, then, then I'm going to believe you. And, and, and so that, that's all we did. We, we just, we, sat back and listened to him and he convinced himself that what he was doing, what he was seeing, the pictures he was taking involved uh, extraterrestrials. And when years later, um, when I sat down with him after this was all over with and told Paul, Paul, listen, what you were seeing really wasn't you. I couldn't convince him otherwise. He wasn't going to listen to me. So uh, it was real easy uh, an easy operation because he he convinced himself to believe into it. But there was uh, okay. Let me ask you a couple of. Let's actually clear the air, right? You were there, sure. okay. Uh, um, and I'm not sure if it was me that was hosting on Coast to Coast uh, that night. I don't remember uh, a converse that conversation. So I I, I don't know which you're referring to directly, but certainly that has been mentioned a lot uh, over the years, that, that that's what went on. But but let me ask you this. Did you go into Benowitz's house and move his furniture around to mess with him? Did that ever happen? No, absolutely not. That's, a, that's absolutely false. I wouldn't have had permission to do that. I mean, I couldn't have, unless I got some sort of a search warrant, uh, to do that, uh, I, I couldn't have possibly done that, and I didn't do that. Did anybody in the Air Force move furniture around in his house? Not, not that I know of. Not that I know of. But you have to understand that there was another agency intimately involved in this, and that, that was the National Security Agency. Right. They didn't coordinate what they were doing with us. And, 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 the, and the particular incident I tell people is that when I was I was at Paul's house, myself and another agent by the name of Steve Adset, we were at his house one night. It was a rainy night in Albuquerque. And Paul said, there's somebody across the street in that house in the corner. And and Paul said, but that house is vacant. There shouldn't be anybody in there. So we, we watched and we could see lights going on over there and we could re- we I realized what we were seeing were were lights on a, on a camera, a video camera. Not, and I, you gotta understand this is like 1983, 82, 83 time frame. Right. And so, and so I said, you know what? Somebody's, somebody's recording something over there, Paul. So Steve and I went out. Uh, I'd called uh, an Albuquerque Police Department officer that I knew. He arrived and he's parked a block away. And we we came up an alley and we saw a vehicle parked behind this vacant house. And so uh, we recorded the license number. The, LB, uh, the Albuquerque police officer knocked on the door because it was locked. Somebody came to the door. We He identified himself with federal credentials as a agent and the Albuquerque police officer whose name, his name was Daryl turned to me and he said, you guys know each other. And I looked at his credentials and it was national security agency. And I said, what are you guys doing here? He said, we're doing the same thing you're doing. I said, oh, well, we need to coordinate this. He said, well, you're going to have to coordinate with our supervisors. And he shut the door and I and I and the, the the APD officer knocked on the door again and said, "Hey, you guys have permission here?" He said, "Yeah, we're renting the house." And so, so that's an example of them doing something that wasn't coordinated with us. We had no idea what they were doing. The next day, I contacted the NSA representative on on base, mm-hmm. and I had a my myself uh, and and my supervisor went to their office, sat down, and said, "Listen." If you guys are doing something regarding this operation, then we need to know about it. And the supervisor said, we, we'll tell you what we, we can tell you. And they did. But it, we knew, or I realized, that they were doing more than they were telling us they were doing. What did they say that so, they were doing, Richard? Do you remember? 
they, they were they were in, they were interested in his communications devices, how he was. And and this isn't a secret anymore, but Paul was actually tapping. I don't know how exactly. I'm not a I'm not a scientist, but he was tapping into a community a, a secure communications system on Kirtland that that was uh, operated by the National Security Agency. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we started this because NSA tasked us with with investigating it. And so, and I'm not sure how he did it, but they were interested to know how he was doing it and whether he was working with anyone else. Right. Uh, So that's, that's why they were involved in it. The famous box of pictures that he had in his home. uh, Again, we're going to refer to urban legend here, (laughs) Richard, that you saw the pictures that he was taking and that's that some of these pictures clearly showed craft on the ground with uh, you know flying saw literally that was the description with legs lit up refueling taken off uh, at Kirkland and that you saw these photographs and then after uh, those photographs disappeared and the box disappeared what can you tell me about that well. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's maybe five uh, percent of that accurate. Uh, most of it's not. He had a he had a box of, of photographs. Actually, it was a uh, a um, a file box that you could lock. And he kept when I first met Paul, going back some time, myself and Jerry Miller were over at his residence, and we were discussing his his. Uh, computer system he had and of course this was back in the 80s and he had a pretty sophisticated computer system and plus all these other uh electronical devices that he had on his roof and he he kept pointing to a box on his desk in in his uh, house and he said that right there will prove the existence of what i'm what i have here he kept saying that to us but he would never open it and show us Eventually, one day, one night after dinner, I was there with, with him having dinner with him and his wife. I asked Paul, I said, what about these? Uh, what about that box you kept pointing to? What's in that box? He said, photographs. I said, well, can I see it? So he opened. We went uh, from his dining room table to his office. He opened up the box and he laid out on a big table, a, a somewhat a conference table. He said, I want you to go into the other room and I'm going to lay these out because I don't want you to see what order I'm putting them in. Well, I'm going to eventually see it. But I said, I did what he asked me to do. I came back and I, I looked at him. I wasn't supposed to touch him, but he did have. He had, I don't know how many, uh, quite a few, I'd say maybe 50, uh, some, somewhere between 45 and 50 photographs of, of UFOs that were on the ground, that were in the air that were flying next to aircrafts. Well, some of them I recognized as, as photographs taken somewhere else or in some other uh, venue. Uh, one particular one I saw that I recognized immediately was, an, was a photograph of the McMinnville, Oregon incident. And I'm sure, Jimmy, you know about that. Of course, in, right. Sometime in the 50s. I, I don't remember exactly when in the 50s. Well, I looked at these and I didn't want to embarrass him and say, well, you know, I've seen these before. So a lot of them were pictures that were had already been in in, cir- in, in circuit someplace uh, in magazines or, or, or some other. Of course, we didn't have the Internet back then, so it had to been in magazines or books or something. And, and it looked to me like most of them were a picture of a picture. And but there were some. That he, he that he had taken, and it was clear that he had taken them over Kirtland uh, Air Force Base uh, because of the uh, terrain. I could look at the terrain and see it was Kirtland. That he took pictures of things, and I, I can't to this day uh, explain what he was what he took a picture of. In fact, our we had an expert had some another agent who was a photographic uh, specialist come in and look at these pictures. To see, to try to figure out what is that, and when was that taken? And he had a date; he had dates on, so we knew when it was taken. But we, there wasn't any other record uh, on base of anybody reporting 
a particular UFO or, or, or some other craft, unusual craft flying next to a, an aircraft coming in for landing. So you had some that were unexplained, but most of those were easily explained as a, as him taking a picture of a picture. Did you, um, again, I'm referring to urban legend. Uh, you're with me now, and I appreciate uh, uh, you being here and, and answering these questions because we, these are things that we've always wanted to know. Did you provide Paul ben- Benowitz uh, documents pertaining to the UFO subject proving the existence of UFOs that you created? No, no. No, what we, what we, I didn't even do it. I, another uh, agent uh, uh, did this, and, and we we took um, a particular briefing document that uh, we had, and we let uh, Paul read it, and it, and it was in fact uh, classified. I mean, the classification wasn't real. We put a classification on it to convince Paul that what he was reading was real. But I didn't do that. I wasn't there at the time. In fact, during that time period, I was in Washington, D.C. doing something else. But some other people had done that. Now, NSA had a long two-hour meeting with Paul uh, sometime towards the end of the operation. And I'm not sure what they did or what they showed him. Uh, I know what has been written, and I I know why you asked that question, but uh, I never uh, personally showed him anything like that. Why? What's the goal in doing something like that? You know, is it? Well, one it, of the, is, well okay, I'll, I'll let you answer that because you know I've got like three questions that are, <laughs> that are right behind that. But, okay. but but what what's the goal in 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 doing that? It's spreading. It's spreading something. Uh, spreading disinformation you that that's what you want to say yes. absolutely i agree with 100 percent. but what we what we do is okay hold on richard somebody, hold on richard hold on hold on hold on that, let's back up for a second you said that you okay. showed him a briefing document that you changed the class you added a classification to are you saying that that briefing document was not that that was disinformation or was the briefing document an actual briefing document I'm confused. No, no, it wasn't a briefing document. It was a, uh, it was disinformation. It wasn't real. It was I mean, some re- of the things in it probably was. Like I said, I didn't. I saw this later. I I saw it in the file later that it was done by an, another agent. Uh, so when you say me, I didn't. My my organization, Air Force OSI, did. Right, but I didn't personally. That, so uh, yeah, I, that's what I wanted. Uh, and to, I didn't create it. Right, that's but, what I wanted to. They did. They did. Yes. <laughs> okay, OSI yeah. did. It was a fake document yeah. with a f- fake classification used for disinformation uh, shown to Paul Benowitz. You were in D.C. You weren't there when the fake document was shown to him. Now, right, um, but, right? But okay. I, I agree. Now, right. now, now, now we're clear. Okay, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Okay. I didn't know if you see. It sounded like you had suggested that the document was real. You just added a top secret classification, but that wasn't the case. It was, it was, it was a fake document all along. Got it. Okay, right. so uh, it, but, but it wasn't top secret. It was secret. It was secret. I don't believe it was top secret. I can, re- I, I, as far as I can remember, it, it, it was secret. I believe it was just secret, and it was a. I think it was a one or two page like a summary uh you spent a long time so i i can't remember but but the reason we do this the reason we did that is if somebody was if somebody had gotten into some real information some real top secret communications systems or real top secret operations that were occurring on Kirtland that involved some really highly classified uh, projects, we would want that person to think that what they were actually seeing was UFOs and not real U.S. government operations where they can go out and start spreading this out. And and eventually during that time period, of course, the Soviets would, would, would end up with it. So, so 
it's a it's a what we don't call it a, a disinformation we call it counterintelligence so the counterintelligence operation where we try to keep them thinking okay it's it's a ufo it's not really a a uh a uh a, a, i mean we think we want them to think it's a ufo and not the real operation that they might have accidentally got into and now this disinformation obviously is going to uh snowball throughout the UFO community too as well. I mean was that part of well, was that part of your goal? No, and we 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 didn't uh at that point uh, we didn't look beyond Paul Benowitz. The operation was was uh, targeted uh for Paul Benowitz and his company Thunder Scientific. Right. Uh, and what, what, where it went from there, what, what wouldn't be our responsibility. And, and let me tell you now what, and this is no longer classified because it was declassified some years ago. Um, what the Air Force was doing, what NSA was doing was they had a facility on Kirtland that was shooting a laser at Soviet satellites as it was coming over. And there was a communication system used to to mask, uh, and I, I, I'm not I'm I'm explaining as a layperson, sure, as, as to mask it. And and Paul had tapped into that communication system and the frequencies involved in doing this. And and what this uh, what this uh, a laser would do is is basically blind the Soviet satellite as it was flying over. And they had it there, and they had it out of Area 51. And it had it at a couple other facilities. And this was an experimental stage. They, they, they didn't have an operational, but they were they were doing that. And so that's why it was highly classified back then. So that's why we couldn't let that out. But why not? And it's certainly hindsight is very dangerous, uh, Richard. But <laughs> why not just tell them the truth? Why not just tell them, as an American citizen, you would understand, hey, man, you know, it's the Soviets, we got this thing going on, you've tapped into that, it's not UFOs, and this is very highly classified, so just do your duty as a patriot and keep your mouth shut. That's what's really going on. No harm, no foul. Well, uh, like you said, hindsight's always twenty twenty, or most of the time is twenty twenty. but uh, I I wasn't in a position to... Uh, write the operations operational plan. This comes from a supervisor or headquarters in Washington, uh, intelligence community, and they they decide on what how they are going to uh, conduct these operations and how they're going to target people. And I'm the player in the bottom of the totem pole that is actually doing this. I'm the agent in the field doing this. So yeah, it it, it would it would probably at some in some instances, it would be uh, better to just tell them the truth, but um, I didn't have the option of doing that. Might have saved a man's life, you know, uh, again, hindsight. But let me, okay, now let's, let's, let's keep going. I've got 100 questions for you, Richard. <laughs> so let's, well, let me talk to you. Let me say something about Paul Benowitz. Paul Benowitz, um, he, he smoked three to four packs of cigarettes a day, right. and he, he drank um Continuously, every time you looked at him, he had uh, a Coca Cola. He would he would have not a not a can, but a quart size. Uh, so he wasn't in very good health in the early eighties. And even when he when they made him stop smoking later on, uh, he uh, you know his health had deteriorated because of him uh, because of the the, the the cigarette smoking. I mean, I was in the room his in his hospital room when a doctor came in and said to him, Paul, you killed yourself over these 55 years of smoking. And there's nothing we can do about that, but we're trying to do everything we can to keep your, you know, keep your life active. But, it, but, but that's, you know, Paul wasn't in the best of, of physical condition. So when we say might've kept him alive, I, I would doubt that. Uh, yeah, I know he went in the hospital. He had a neuro breakdown, but but that was, ca was caused by a couple other factors. One of them is business. Thunder Scientific Laboratories uh, had lost a real big contract because of him. Paul 
Paul was so hung up with this this UFO business that he he neglected what he should have been doing in his uh, business. Well, of course, Richard, of course, because he was shown documents that they were real from his own government. And so absolutely, I think if, <laughs> I cannot imagine how many people would be pushed over the edge, you know, uh, given that same circumstance, you know, myself included. You know, that's a pretty crazy thing to show to somebody. We always, you know, we have that question, you know, are we being visited? Uh, what am I seeing in the sky? Is it, is it real? Is it this? And then, you know, your own government says, hey, man, okay, you know, they're real and we want you to come and, and, and work with us. That, that to somebody that may not be already stable is, is a, is a bad position to put somebody in. I wasn't there. But I'm just saying, if I was shown documents and and from the government, not from you know some ufologist, right? But from the Air Force themselves, holy crap, right? Well, okay, let me let's uh, and that's my take. Uh, I, I don't know about the cigarettes and 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 the physical health and and the Coca Cola, but you're making me want to change my diet for sure. Um, <laughs> is, is this Richard? What about? the the Dulcy uh, situation um, there again I'm, I'm I'm going back to urban legend but did you push him in that direction as well the underground base no 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 Paul had already uh, prior to us becoming involved in this operation Paul had already made a number of trips to Dulcy. And uh, he had gotten information from this other person, and I don't really want to bring this other person involved in it, but there's actually, it was an operation, never been disclosed, but uh, there was a, um, uh, an operation involving another person uh, that was Paul's friend in this, this whole uh, business. And um, he got Paul involved in a Dulce incident, Archuleta Peak. Mm-hmm. Paul, excuse me, Paul, Paul told me uh, one day when I was had a, con, uh, a discussion with him, he said, well, I know where the alien base is located. It's up in Dulce, New Mexico. It's at Archidata Peak. And I said, well, how do you know that? He said, because I've been up there and I've taken pictures. And he, then he showed me, well, he showed me a video. He flew over it, right? right? He took a plane up there. Yeah, he took, yeah, he took a plane up there. Right. But and and he he'd taken some pictures of of some things. And and he actually uh him and this this other his colleague had camped up there overnight or camped near there overnight. I, I believe they slept in a vehicle or, or or something. But anyways, they spent the night and they took some videos that were really really un- I mean, I looked at these videos and I couldn't explain them. I went, "Wow, look, this is really neat." So anyways, I said to Paul, I said, well, take me up there sometime. So we did. We went up there. We sat around. We looked around. We didn't, you know, we drove around, uh, didn't really see much, but he he pointed out where everything was at. Well, a, a week or so later, we went up there and we, we went up there. So we were be, would be up there at night. And then we saw helicopters. We saw helicopters. We saw all these strange lights up there. And I started wondering, what the heck was this stuff? So when, when we got back, I said to Paul, I said, we, you know, I don't know what that is, Paul. I, I, I said, but those helicopters were, were uh, Vietnam Air helicopters. I mean, I, I know that they were Hueys or uh, I, I said, but, and then there were some I, don't, I did, couldn't recognize. So I said, but I don't know about those, those strange lights and those strange beams. I don't know what they were. Well, <clears throat> I went up to Fort Carson, Colorado a few weeks later and met with a, a special forces unit up there and found out that uh, they used that area for military operations. And I asked uh, one of the pilots, actually the commander, he was also the, one of the senior pilots, uh, about these strange lights or strange beams. He said, well, he said, we have lights underground. I mean, we have these uh, lights that are, that are in the built in the ground that would shine up and they simulated different uh, things for the helicopter pilots. 
He says, so we turn them on when helicopter pilots are coming in. He says, so I can just imagine how strange they would look if somebody was down on the bottom of the mountain looking up. So that explained to me what they were. But I never told Paul that. And, and, and Paul would, would always tell people that there was an underground base in Archuleta. I never told him there was. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't ever support that because it really wasn't in the operational plan. I mean, that, that was just something that he, he wanted to believe in and would let him, you know, if he wants to believe in it, he can believe in it. But, yeah, and so, well, uh, Richard. I, I, so I never told him there was a base. Right, but you didn't tell him that there wasn't a base. No, I, I, that's right. I didn't tell him there wasn't a base. Did he seem at that time, did he seem stable? Um, and wouldn't it have maybe, again, <laughs> hindsight, right? But to to maybe not uh, mess with them at all and maybe come clean on that and tell them that, you know, these are special operations forces up there. And I thought it was something strange, so I went and checked it out for myself. I spoke to them, and this is actually what's going on. Well, he knew I went to Fort Carson because I told him that. And, uh, but he, he was under the impression that the, the, the government, uh, I mean, I don't have enough time uh, here. I would take uh, hours and hours to explain to you sure. what Paul told me and what he thought he knew. And so it was very difficult for me to, 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 to convince, try to convince him otherwise. So I never did. Paul would, would spend, um, uh, 30 minutes talking to me without me ever saying a word. He was trying to convince me that what he was seeing was, in fact, extraterrestrial. And he would go on and on and on and on. And, and I would, couldn't, couldn't get a word in edgewise. And I finally would say to him, you know, I'd make the timeout sign. I'd say, Paul, timeout. I'm going to have to step in here and say a few words. And at times, I would try to convince him to stray him back onto what we wanted him, and and he wouldn't. He would get off the subject. And then years later, I mean, I was I was friends with Paul right up until he he passed away. He was my friend. He would call me. He would invite me over to his house. My wife and my, and, and went over there. We had dinner a number of times. We went out to dinner, and and at those times, I tried. I tried my darnest to convince Paul that it was what he was seeing was not extraterrestrial. I never told him it was, you know, what the the, the classified project was. But I, I I told him, Paul, you didn't see you didn't see a, uh, extraterrestrials. What you're seeing on that computer screen isn't an extraterrestrial talking to you. But he 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 couldn't be he wouldn't listen to me. And he had a computer screen. And oh, I think it was a Commodore, or uh, I think they were called Commodores back then. Mm-hmm. Anyways, he had a screen, he had it rigged up, and he had a, all these antennas in, on his roof, and he had a, he had a, actually a small microwave. Actually, he we actually had FCC came in and made him get a license for it. But anyways, he had a little a small portable microwave on his roof, and he would look at the screen, and there would be images on the screen, but. It, Certainly weren't, uh, wasn't of an alien, but he was convinced that was. And I would actually tell him, Paul, I don't see anything. He said, I see it and I can hear him. And he had these earphones that he would put on and he said, I can hear him talking. I said, well, what language are they speaking? He said, they're speaking their language. I said, well, you don't understand their language, do you, Paul? He said, no, but I know that it's an intelligent language. And he wrote a whole, gosh, probably a hundred page uh, 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 document or typed, it was typed about the alien language. He, he wrote and he, he gave it to us when he came out to Kirtland to present, give his presentation to all these generals, he presented them with that. And plus all these other d- documents that he created to convince, try to convince them, them that the, the Kirtland air force base was in danger of an alien invasion. What does the Air Force know? What is it that they are not telling us, not about Paul Benowitz, about the UFO question? What do they know? Well, I know what I was briefed on and, uh, in 1979, and uh, I'm convinced I have no reason to, to, to think otherwise or to believe otherwise that, that we had been visited. We have been visited. Roswell was real. 
There were other crash sites that were real. And the Air Force knows. The government knows. Not just the Air Force, but the whole government knows. And they have known. And and so what I was briefed on was what occurred in the uh, late 40s and 50s. Now, what has happened since I got I left uh, the, uh, the the intelligence community in 1988, so I I don't know what I know. A lot of people claim that I I'm still involved, and they know that somebody got my records and found that I was recalled active duty back in 1983, 84. I was, but it wasn't anything to do with UFOs. So uh, uh, I can't say it. What it was didn't surprise me of the uh, the the release by the Air Force and admission that they had been they had this project that it, it, they had for a number of years uh, that was started. I mean, that's the that's the unclassified portion of it. I'm I'm convinced, and I have still friends that are involved. I'm convinced that the Air Force still is investigating these things and they're still involved uh, in, in this project. How did the briefing, when you say that you were briefed on Roswell and other crashes, how, how does that happen? Were you shown documents and photographs or was it verbal? There's a, there, no, it was a, it, there's a, uh, I think there were 20 some of, of us in the room. Uh, it, it's a special uh, it's called uh, uh, Air Force Special Security Office that you briefed in. It's uh, code word. Uh, you have to have special clearances to, do, to to get into this program. It's a it's a briefing uh, video or a, a film. It's, it's back in those days, it was like a I don't know whatever sixteen millimeter or whatever they were that they used. It was a film, a film uh, briefing intelligence people on this subject, and it showed. Uh, old uh, uh, films of the recovery of the Roswell crash, the two crashes, the one at uh, Corona, New Mexico, and the one at uh, Magdalena out at uh, uh, Horse Mesa. Uh, and what the air, what it is in, was in the briefing document. There was two. There was t- two aliens crash crafts that crashed, that collided in air and then crashed at two different locations one in Krona, mm-hmm. not roswell it was north of roswell but near Krona, south southeast of Krona. and then one the other uh craft crashed uh north or uh, south west of magdalena new mexico that craft what that crash site wasn't found until 1949 the crash site near Krona was found in 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 47 right. in the summer of 47 the, the, and there was one live alien that was found in the craft, the crash site in Corona. The one in forty nine, they found bodies, but they were they were uh, uh, decayed uh, horribly. Uh, so, but but the crafts were similar in nature, and so and and over during the investigation process back in those days, they just figured that these two crafts collided. And I think it was an electrical storm. And I know Los Alamos was involved in this. And I think one of the scientists figured it, it probably was some kind of electrical storm that, that caused it anyways. And, and then the briefing, and then there's a colonel that gave this briefing. And he went on to reiterate a lot of different things and how the, the, the government was still investigating these things. And, and that there was possibly the possibility that there were, uh, extraterrestrials visiting Earth that that we, we the government didn't know about, but they wanted to keep track of. And when Reagan became president, Reagan was briefed on an incident, and I don't know the full details of it that had occurred uh, in uh, around Washington D.C. and the a craft was landed, and 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 I don't think this was ever has ever been disclosed by anybody, but. And it was, I think it was in 82 or the latter part of 81. And anyways, that scared the government. That scared the Air Force. That scared the CIA. It scared the FBI. And it scared Reagan. And Reagan then started another program to try to keep track and, and, and try to develop some kind of a system to keep track of everything that entered uh, Earth's orbit. And that was 
part of the uh, strategic defense initiative. Right. Did you? Um, that's fascinating stuff, and I had never heard uh, heard that before. Um, and neither has the audience. I'm sure that uh, this uh, those comments will uh, be uh, uh, <laughs> circulating tomorrow around the internet. Well, our, uh, our uh, Bell knows about. It. <laughs> I discussed that with our Bell years ago. <laughs> okay, um, is uh, uh, a couple of other things when. Um, uh, the this this thing that happened uh, a couple of months ago now it's December sixteenth uh, with that uh, disclosure that went into the media um, is is that part of it, is that something that the Air Force would be involved in 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 that type of disclosure with the uh, with the gun camera footage from the Navy. Uh, you know, this is the Pentagon program that apparently was running uh, that nobody knew about. Senator Harry Weir, you know, you know everything about the or Harry Reid. I'm sorry. Um, is that is that part of disinfo? I don't think so. I, I think that's probably uh, somebody as an office up there that is trying to get out and getting the truth out a disclosure out and I'm all for disclosures. I, I've tried and, and a number of times and, and, you know, people say, well, you disinformation. I can't, we can't believe anything you say. Well, you know what? You can't believe what I say because I did my job back in those days, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not with the government anymore. Are they, paying, oh, oh, the okay. government. are they, are they, are you being paid by them to be on, to call into this show and surprise me tonight? No, absolutely okay. not. Okay, all right. Nobody's paying okay. me for this. Absolutely not. Well, you know they're. Th- you I'm know, not being paid by the government okay. in any way. You know they're saying this no. right now out there. They're going. You know. Uh, I, know. It, you know yeah. I know. I okay. know. You can't convince uh, people. You know the Phil Class once told me at a UFO convention some years ago, and I had a pretty good relationship with Phil, even though I I, I called him uh, names and 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 threatened to beat his butt if he was was a little younger but i mean and, and joke in a joking manner but phil told me he said you know what i don't have to do anything i have to sit here the ufo community does more harm to themselves than i could ever do and that's the truth well that's the truth. well and which which takes me to this so let's let's back up uh uh, uh, uh has there been an active disinfo campaign going on inside of the UFO community with other researchers and conferences and conventions around the country. Not not uh, disinformation, but what we did do, and I was involved in this, was that we planted or we co-opted people that were already involved in the UFO community, such as Bill Moore. Uh, you we know, that, co-opted, that's where I was we, going. We co-opted, okay. yeah, we co-opted them to report on activities that are occurring within UFO groups. APRO, uh, which was you know way back, you know, you mm-hmm. know that, mm-hmm. and MUFON, mm-hmm. and some of these other, other groups. We would just uh, sometimes pay people to report to us what the, what the UFO group was collecting. We never, ever, in fact, we were absolutely prohibited from providing information to these groups. All we wanted to do was for them to report back to us. Did and, Bi- and, and we did that. Did Bill Moore know from the get-go that that's what was going on? No. Bill, Bill Moore was recruited. Um, he was involved in something entirely unrelated to UFOs. Bill Moore had a contact. uh, First of all, Bill Moore spoke Russian and he had learned it in school and he had a con he had contacts with uh, Soviet researchers, legitimate UFO Soviet researchers. He had a pen pal or he called it a pen pal, but he had a contact with somebody inside Moscow Inside Soviet Union, inside Moscow, in Moscow, who who they corresponded with back and forth. Well, we we knew about that, and when we approached Bill, we wanted him to report to us what this scientist was saying, and expanding that to 
uh, to allow us to make contact with this person, uh, the CIA make contact that that person inside uh, the, the Soviet Union, which which began an operation, and, and we that was very successful. And during this time period, uh, you know, of course, Bo- uh, Bill had a number of uh, contacts. Uh, within APRO and uh, MUFON and some other agent, uh, some of the UFO community, right? Uh, because of the the book he wrote on uh, uh, the Philadelphia experiment, and then Roswell with with uh, uh, who's the guy uh, Berlitz, I yeah, think. yeah. And so, so we were interested, and we that was just kind of a second thought by our supervisors: why don't we get him involved and get have him reporting? you know, uh, on what they're doing within APRO. And so he did because Bill had a lot of access to, to, to APRO. And, and, and another person that was very, very, very cooperative with us, he wasn't my asset. I didn't recruit him, but somebody down in, uh, in Arizona out of uh, uh, Davis Mountain Air Force Base, one of the OS agents down there recruited him was Wendell Stevens. No, Wendell was a, what? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Wendell was. Wendell would at, at the UFO conventions. Wendell would invite certain people up to his room and show us things that he had gotten from. He wouldn't tell us who or some some footage of something that he had gotten from somebody. He would never ever tell us, and I don't know that that maybe OSI knew about it because he was being handled by somebody down in Arizona and I didn't have privy to that information because it's pr- pretty, um, uh, 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 closely guarded. It's compartmented, but he would always show us things. And, and we, I walk away scratching my head, like, where did he get the hat? But, but window was, I mean, I could name some others, but, but they were, uh, they were, uh, and we call them cooperate, cooperating people. Somebody would cooperate with us. They might not have uh, given us everything we wanted, but and I think Window had been, had of course been in the Air Force, and 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 Window was you could relate to him as being you know a former blue suitor because he was Air Force, right? And he would you know he would be more forthcoming. Uh, well, let, what, 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 let's get back to Wendell Stevens in in in, in just a bit. Let's get let, let's go back to Bill Moore for a second. Um, okay. Did uh, the MJ twelve documents? Did you supply those to Bill Moore? Absolutely not. Where did he uh, get I mean, them that from? Was, that's been proven and 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 disproven by. I mean, I went through two FBI investigations on that crap, and I I I, I take two polygraphs. I didn't do it. I don't know who did. I, I, I have my suspicions, but uh, I can't prove it. And uh, I don't know that the government knows. Uh, but, but I didn't. Bill brought it, brought him to me, and I told Bill when I when he brought him to me, I said, Bill, I I don't. Who gave these to you? He said, I can't tell you that. Well, shortly after this, this Jamie Shandera shows up. Right. And I had never, I'd never met him or, or, or had anything to do with him. But, well, Jamie had a lot of contacts within DIA. He had names. He would drop names of people who I knew. I wouldn't, I wouldn't acknowledge that I knew him to, to Jamie, but he would, he would start naming these people. And I thought, well, how did he know? And I started thinking maybe he's an asset or maybe he's an agent. Jamie Shandera, the TV producer. Yeah. Yeah. He looked asset ish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he Have looked, you ever met him? Uh, no. And I've, I've tried to chase him down. You know, we live in broadcast out of Burbank and that's that was uh, him and Bill Moore's headquarters for a number of years was right here. Yeah. Um, right. But I I don't I don't know if he's still alive. I I can't find any record on him. I would love to talk to he he's got to be getting up there in years. He would be probably in his mid eighties, I would think. Well, in in two thousand six, let me see, two thousand five, no, two thousand six. 
he was alive. Um, he showed up at the uh, at the when they still had the UFO conventions in Laughlin. Mm-hmm. He showed up there with um, Bill Ryan and um, I can't think of Bill Ryan's girlfriend's name, but I'm, I don't know if you know them. But yeah, anyway, C- Carrie and, Cassidy. Carrie Cassidy. Carrie Cassidy. There we go. She's a she's a character. <laughs> she's a character. But, but anyway. Anyways, um, he showed up, and uh, I knew, I mean, I just look at him and tell that he was on some kind of uh, either prescription drug or illegal drugs. He, he, he just, he would rant about things that happened to him. Um, he had m- marks on his body where he claimed that he'd been on a beach at uh, some beach in California, and the Navy SEALs uh, landed and took him in a helicopter and took him to a, a Coronado, Coronado Island and put him in a brig and beat him because he saw uh, them training aliens. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's just one of his many, many stories that he would tell. But that was the last time I saw him, so I, I have no idea where Jamie would be now today. Now, Bill Moore, for for which seemed like forever, uh, going around to all of the conferences and the radio shows, and next week, just wait, I've got a new document, I've got a new letter, I've got a new official Air Force this, I've got this, and, and I'm going forward. Uh, it, it, it was a weekly or monthly thing with Bill Moore. Did you supply him with those letters and documents that he kept uh, bringing forward? No. Where was no. he getting them from? I, you know what? Bill did his own thing. He had his own contacts, and uh, Bill uh, was on his own. And there's a lot of times uh, he was. He called me once and told me he was going to do a. Um, I'm not sure if it was a television or radio show. Yeah, I believe it was in Seattle, and that's when his car was broken into and there was a number of documents stolen out of his briefcase. And he, he called me and told me about this incident. And I said, Bill, what the heck are you doing running around? That what kind of documents are they? And he told me, he said, well, they're documents that were given to me by some other people. I said, who, by who? He said, well, I can't tell you that. I said, Bill, you running around doing this stuff. I, I suggest you not do it. Don't do it anymore. But he still did it. So, uh, and, and later on, I think probably after, 86, uh, I just broke off contact with him. Uh, I, I didn't actually terminate him as a asset on paper, but I just didn't, uh, I listed him as a, uh, uh, non-cooperative, uh, asset. So I didn't really believe or, uh, uh, collect information that he was supplying. And I don't think he'd supplied much after that. What did you, what did you supply bill? Bill Moore? Yes. Um, As an asset, he's in the UFO community. He's an author. He's a researcher. He's a public speaker uh, and doing his uh, and author books. What did you supply him that was disinfo? I didn't supply him anything that was disinfo. The problem with Bill Moore is that he was so, vo- so much involved in the UFO, UFO community before I ever met him in 19... 19- like 80 or 79, whatever it was that I couldn't, I couldn't disinform Bill. Bill already knew and Bill could see things and he, and Bill had access. He had his own sources, which I didn't find out until years later. He had a Colonel that was stationed at Norton air force base. That was uh, OSI. And I didn't find this out until 2001 or so, but he, this, this, Air Force OSI agent was giving him information. Now, whether he was using him too as an asset, I don't know. But I never gave Bill a thing, any disinformation, because if I would have tried, Bill would have doubted me. He would have said, "I don't want to. I don't want to muddy the waters. I'm already in good with these people. If I bring something in that's not true, and there's so many other people that figure it out, it's not true, then." My credibility is down the drain, so so we didn't do that with Bill. Well, why did uh, you're calling him an asset though? What did he do for you? He reported to us. Well, on the Soviet thing, that's entirely that, that's a counter espionage operation that he was 
he was involved with, which I'm not even going to go into details on that. He was doing that. And plus, he was a member of a UFO group. He would tell us what they were doing. Hey, they had a meeting. They discussed all these different sightings. So-and-so is in charge. So-and-so is a field investigator. Here's the phone numbers. Uh, he, here's how many field reports they did and things like that. That's what he reported back to us. And, and why was that important to the Air Force? To keep track of the UFO community, to keep track of what they were doing, because the the more eyes and ears you have in, a, in the intelligence community, the better it's going to be. If you have a thousand people reporting back to us on what they're doing, what they're seeing, and what's occurring in their area, then that's that's better for the United States. That's better for national security because we can keep track then of what's occurring. Now, you know, ninety percent of everything that Bill's reporting, as far as reports that the APRO or 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 Mufon was was receiving, was probably fully explainable. Because remember, in that time period, we didn't have Project Blue Book anymore, so we had we still were interested in in, in in reports and of of sightings of of of, of objects and and some of them could be Soviet or could be hostile. So that's why we were doing it. It's part of a big plan. It was just not it was all over the United States. In fact all over the world we were doing this, trying to keep uh, a track of what was occurring that we we the Air Force didn't know. Were you there when he did the uh, you know did the speech where he came clean and ran out the back door in Las Vegas? Nineteen ninety one. No. no, I wasn't there. You weren't but, there. But but Bill told me uh, Bill. Uh, I met Bill in um, in in uh, Laughlin before this because it was in Vegas. But I, met, I I we we met in Laughlin, and Bill told me what he was going to do, and. I we had dropped him in probably eighty eight or eighty seven or I'm not sure. We dropped him. We just told him no more. I'm not going to pay you for travel or pay you for anything. So it's over with. And he said, okay. I, he under, fully understands this. And then he he then I I had contact with him occasionally here and there. And 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 we met in Laughlin. I think it was a, a two or three days before the the Vegas uh, speech. And he told me exactly what he's going to do. And he said, and he was he was quite uh, um, irritating to me, um, of because he said, "I'm going to do this, and nobody's going to change my mind." And he he gave me a draft of his speech, and I looked at it and I said, "You know, there's a lot of things in here, Bill. I wouldn't suggest you." He said, "I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it." I said, "Fine, Bill. You know, I'm I'm not going to stop you. You want to do it? Do it." And he did. How much did you pay? Then, how much? How much did you pay uh, Bill Moore? Um, we paid him for travel. We paid him for um, uh, mostly what we paid him for just travel or, or expenses. Uh, but we didn't actually pay him a salary. We Cash reimbursing for travel. Cash. Pardon? Cash. Yeah, 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 cash. Always cash. And he signed for it. Okay. You know, he has a, has a form, and, and, and he signed for it, and then we he he signs the IRS uh, form, too. So, you know, there's two forms he had to sign. But I mean, it was never a lot of money. I mean, I don't think I ever, ever paid him more than $45, $50, something like that, $30. So why do it, then? I mean, for, I mean, for Bill, why do it? I mean, I, I don't I understand. Don't know. I, I, and you know, and today he's a he's a janitor for a junior high school in Pennsylvania, living in a trailer. You know, why? I mean, why? Why go down that road? How many others? Um, and I, I'm going to apologize to the network and all of our sponsors. I've blown through all of the commercials, but and I've never done this before. I'll pay the price uh, for this in the future. Okay, so uh, that those phone calls are coming in tomorrow. Um, how many other assets <laughs> did you have in in ufology? I, there was Bill Moore. Um, how many Me others? Me personally, 
Me personally? No, the Air Force. Had, and, well, okay, let's do oh, you. Well, let's do you personally first because that you would know that directly. How many? I had. Um, I had three. Do and I, I? And this was just in the New Mexico area. Do I know those yeah. three? Uh, well, Bor- Bill Moore being one of them. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, four. Bill would be one, and then there'd be three others. Um, one of them's dead. One of them died many, many years ago. Uh, and the other two um, are still, I don't know that they're involved in the UFO community. One was APRO, and, and one was MUFON. Right. Uh, in, in, the, in the Southwest area. And I'm not going to disclose their names. No, you don't have to. You don't have to. Okay, if I don't know them and it's APRO and it's MUFON and and they're older now and and not involved, okay. Um, Now, what about the Air Force in general? Uh, Did they have, if you had yours, certainly there were others um, under the control of the Air Force. Can you put a number on that? Well, you figure there was 122 Air Force OSI agents that were involved in this program. Mm -hmm. There were 122 that had been briefed, and that's worldwide, that I knew of in 19, well, I knew of uh, as late as 88. And out of those 122, every one of them was required to have assets and up to three or four. So you do the math, there were quite a few. I don't know names. I don't know numbers exactly now after all these years, but I know that uh, I know one particular uh, asset who uh, was uh, probably one of the better ones uh, was one of the senior officials in APRO. uh, I mean, uh, MUFON. I think he was in APRO and MUFON, but he was one of the, he was one of the senior people. Uh, and, 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 and I knew he was involved. I knew because the agent that was handling him always bragged about how, how he recruited this guy. And, you know, he was one of the senior directors and, and he was getting all sorts of information from him. So I knew there was some, uh, at least one senior official on our side. And and I understand the collecting of um, of information from inside of these organizations going out, but what about the the disinformation going back into these organizations? Be it rumor, be it photographs, uh, uh, documents, or just stories? Uh, did that occur? No, we were specifically. You know that's a pretty um, that's a pretty strong no coming out of you. Yeah, absolutely not. We were not allowed. Um, we were specifically forbidden to do that unless there was some type of operation that specifically targeted a particular incident, such as if if give me a, I'll give you an example. If uh, John Smith is driving down a road and the UFO lands next to him and shuts his vehicle off, and and the only person that had gained any knowledge about this UFO was uh, the field investigator for MUFON or APRO, and so they do a report, and they don't send it to anybody, but they keep it in. But our asset within that a- APRO or MUFON gives it to us, now we're going to start an investigation and now maybe we would try some kind of counterintelligence operation against the person not 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 the field investigator not the group but but the person that had the encounter that's the only time we would be allowed to do something like that does uh does the air force osi um do they have assets right now inside of mufon I I left in eighty eight. I have no idea. Oh, I would imagine. Oh, okay. You can imagine that they do. Do you uh, now? Do you still communicate at all with anybody in the Air Force OSI? We have a group of retired Association of Retired Intelligence Officers, and within that group, there's a there's another uh, smaller group that uh, all of us had been involved in that program. 
And there wasn't just OSI. It was some, some guys had been FBI that had been briefed into a DIA. And we have a few uh, CIA uh, officers. And we meet uh, annually or sometimes semi-annually. And there's, there's uh, about 52 left. There's a lot more years ago, but they die off. And, and we still meet. And we sit and talk. And none of us are involved. None of us have security clearances anymore. None of us uh, have access to anything. But others tell us things. And we have ways of, of obtaining information. And we meet and we talk about it. And I know that there's probably uh, a good intelligence network uh, still alive, just like the way we had it. And maybe even better than we had it. Did you, um, I think you've talked about this in the past, but uh, did you, did you operate undercover? Did you go to these meetings um, as a civilian? I would go to, um, I have, yes, I have, I have. I've gone through some UFO conventions back in the 80s, uh, not as, as myself, yes, I have. And does the Air Force, uh, man, do, do you feel strange admitting that today? Does it feel a little dirty? If I'm, uh, I missed it. I mean, I mean did, did, does, I, does, does do it, I feel strange if the Air Force sent me or what, what, what do you, what I do mean, you mean, you know, it's clandestine. It's inside of the United States. You're, you know, you're. You're in the Air Force, and then going to a UFO convention or conference, or um, at dress as a civilian, and and going in and doing that on U.S. soil. You, you know, we're not enemy combatants here, right? <laughs> we're American citizens. Well, well, all I'm doing, all I did was sit and listen. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't do anything clandestine or uh, uh, undercover. I mean, I sat there and listened to uh, the speakers and, and, and maybe mingled with some people and listened to some some people talk or something but, like that. But, but uh, you didn't tell I didn't them. Anything but you illegal. Didn't. I didn't do anything. Um, and, and, and you're talking about dress as a civilian undercover. I wore civilian clothes the entire time I was in OSI. I mean, you, you, we didn't wear uniforms. Well, that's what I'm uh, saying. Well, we, that's Richard. That's what I'm saying. You didn't tell anybody that you were in the Air Force and that you worked for the OSI. You didn't, you know, you didn't disclose that at no. these meetings either. Yeah. Now, uh, now, what about no, others? I did. I did. No, no, no. I did. I had. I had to disclose it to my supervisor. In fact, I was directed to go. No, not your supervisor. I'm talking about the people, the civilians at the conferences. They didn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. yeah. No, no, they didn't know. No. Right, right, right. Now, um, what about those other 120, uh, uh, 122 um, that were in this program with you in the Air Force? That was around the world, but certainly a, a chunk of them were inside of the United States. They were doing the exact same thing, weren't they? Yes. That is a massive infiltration. Massive. I don't know who to trust. <laughs> right? Am well, you I, know what? Am I wrong? It wasn't, in- just, it wasn't just OSI. Office of Navy Intelligence had their own right, people. Right, right. Uh, the FBI had, a, FBI had a really extensive network. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know about the army. I know, I know OSI and Navy. I, I, I don't know about that. I can't speak for the army. And so there was, it's gotta be going, well, see, you know, as you know, I speak at these conferences. Uh, some of them are really, really large. You can't, yep. you can't know everybody that is attending, but I've often suspected that there must be some of them out there you don't know if they could be women or men or young or you, you just don't know that's the first thing but the second thing is these presenters and these people that are around me that we are friends and and um compatriots right but are you saying that yeah. some of them may be assets because that's what you did i would say um uh... Yes, I would say that every UFO group is 
has probably assets uh, belonging to some kind of intelligence uh, agency, whether it would be OSI, FBI, or whoever, and and they're reporting back what the group is doing. Yes, I I, I don't know that for a fact. I, I've been out uh, thirty some years, so I can't say for sure. But I would I would guess that probably is still happening. Is there somebody today on the circuit? that you knew from back then that was an asset? Oh, yes. Two people. Really? That I, I, no, I, didn't, I don't need names. I don't need, I don't, I don't, I, I need to sleep tonight, so I don't need names. But No, but, I'm not going to tell you any names, <laughs> but, but there are two people. One, one more prominent than the other. I mean, one is probably... I don't, I don't happen to keep track of the one, but the one is you hear about him within the UFO community now and then is involved. It, it was, was an asset and probably still, I don't know if he still is or not. And the other person, I, I don't know, uh, but they were, and, and I, I would imagine that there still are. I, I can, in fact, I, the, well, the last uh, uh, UFO convention, I was at 2010 uh, the last one window was at, uh, I pointed out to window and some others in this group right. uh, of who I knew in the audience that were either DIA or air force. I pointed them out right there. One, two, three. And there were something like six of them and they were scattered around the room. And I remember when George <clears throat> Knapp did his, um, uh, uh, Skywalker ranch, a presentation at UFO convention in, uh, Laughlin, I, I don't remember what years, 2000, whatever, five or six or whenever it was. Uh, I was there and there were 20, 20 uh, air, uh, uh, intelligence personnel in that room, 20. And I knew every single one of them. The, 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 I, I just, the community, the UFO community is so freaked out about this, uh, not for about what you're saying. I'm saying that this could be occurring and you know that this is something that you can almost touch and feel when you go to these conferences, everybody is aware they're looking for the feds, right? They're looking for the Fed. They're looking they, because trust in this community is, is paramount. Richard, and you know this, you've known this for years, trust is there and everybody is suspicious. And, and now you are saying that, yes, this has been going on. Uh, the, the amount of numbers, which you just told me, if every 122 uh, agents with four assets each, we're looking at 500, 500, five, that, that is a big chunk of people. That's a that's a that's a large number. So when you go to these conferences, you've you don't know who to trust. Well, that was back in the eighties. I I can't speak for what how many there are now, but I would guess. I mean, just just common sense tells you that the government's going to be keeping track of it. I mean, and, and they're not violating any laws. They're just they're listening to what you're saying, what what the speakers are saying. They're not. Uh, they're not uh, trying to uh, convince anybody of anything, uh, and we never did. We went to the conventions, and we were there to listen and listen to what their speakers were saying. Uh, and you know, some of them we found very interesting, and and then we report back, do a report back that hey, we went to this UFO convention, and 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 we and so many this speakers spoke about this. This guy lectured about this. So and so and so and so and so and so and. And that's it. That's it. We we didn't, you know, tap any rooms or wiretap. We would, would be prohibited from doing anything like that. We never did anything illegal. We did. We just sat there and listened. So yes, but- I, I I think it, I think the UFO community they don't have anything uh, to hide, um, and they, they wouldn't have anything to lose by sitting in a room with with 50 intelligence officers and, and, and lecturing to a crowd of 
5,000 with 50 in the room. What difference would it make? Well, but but that's that's the interesting part for me. When you're suggesting that, you know, the infiltration is there, the assets are there, they're inside of the community, reporting back to you and the other agents, uh, these are these are agents with a career, they're getting paid, and they have a job to do, and these assets, after hanging out at an after party or this, or at, picking up the phone and calling their handler saying, okay, this happened at the conference today, so-and-so said this, somebody had this, somebody had this photograph of this, and if that is going on, that is nuts, and that's exactly what you're saying happened, Right. Well, I don't, I can't say that, <laughs> I can't say, I can't speak for anybody but myself. I can't speak for any of these other agents or what they were getting or how much information they were getting, or whether they were getting documents or, or reports or photographs. Uh, it, it wasn't as, as prevalent as you might make it sound to be. There, there, there wasn't some kind of a, um, a repository where were thousands of, of pages of, of information coming out of these UFO groups were being filed. It wasn't like that. Very, very, in fact, Bill Moore uh, didn't give a whole lot of information uh, and or the other assets I had, uh, some gave me stuff that was already printed in a newspaper or a magazine or or I listened to on a radio or was in a newspaper or a television report. So it wasn't any kind of secrets that was occurring within the UFO community. It was stuff that they call would call me and say, Hey, you know, we took uh, four reports yesterday or last week or last month or six months ago about these sightings that occurred in, in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico or silver city or wherever. Okay. And I would say, okay, uh, and, and I would already, probably already know a lot of it. So I, I can only speak for myself about what I was getting from these assets. Okay, two quick questions, and I, I'm going to thank you in advance for for this surprise visit, number one. Number two, for, for allowing me to drill you <laughs> these questions for the last hour and a half. I didn't expect this, and, and again, I apologize to all of our sponsors on the show and the network. Uh, uh, for neglecting my commercial breaks. Well, I sure hope you don't get in trouble. I, you know what? You know what, Richard? Some things have to be. You know, it's uh, it is what it is. Okay. Uh, first question: the aviary, fictitious, created? It was created by somebody else. I, I <laughs> in fact, the, the the absolute truth is that aviary was was already being uh, circulated, and I didn't even know I was involved in it. I, I honest to God, I did not know uh, I was involved. And I can't really put a finger on who started it. I, I thought it might have been Robert Collins, right. but he denies it. He says it was uh, Jamie Shandera right. or, or somebody, or uh, Carrie, or, but I don't know. I don't know who started it. Were you involved? And, and the people that were involved and uh, names uh, were, uh, I mean, some of them like Dr. Uh, Hal Putoff and Dr. Kit Green, who are very good friends of mine today, they would call me and say, what's this Avery thing? And I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't start it. I, I don't know what. So somebody else started it. Who was Falcon? Falcon, the real Falcon, mm -hmm. the real, real Falcon was Richard Helms. Really? Yeah. Okay. Now Richard that's... Helms was the real, real Falcon. And to cover him, I was was named Falcon because Richard Helms uh, was my uh, very, very, very dear friend. He was, a, he was my father. He was friends of my father's. And then, uh, of course, I knew him from that, but I, I became friends with him right up until he passed away. And, 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 and Richard was the, uh, he was the real Falcon. I'm, I'm, and that's been, that's not, uh, that's not news. I mean, it's been out for some time. It, it's, it's been out, but I didn't, I did not know that you and him had that relationship that I didn't know. There were rumors going on forever 
that uh, Dick Helms was uh, was indeed the real Falcon. Um, yep. Now, and I had now you, you, you should hear some of his stories. <laughs> well, I've I've say, I saw his uh, recent <laughs> interviews uh, that he did. Uh, uh, the there's a documentary out the surviving. Uh, head of the CIA directors, right? They all get together and talk about the bomb. I don't know if uh, yeah. if you've seen that, but uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, okay, you know, I, again, I want to thank you. I had one more question, but uh, I, I can't. I've lost it. It was in front of me. <laughs> I had one more question, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Richard, I, I again thank you uh, for calling in. What we should do? I mean, I was completely unprepared for this, um, but uh, if you'd like, now I understood you knew I was calling. No, this no, I got <laughs> no, 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 no. I got okay. a text. Okay. I got a text to look out for uh, four numbers. Your last four. That's what I got. I didn't know. Okay. I I, okay. I had I had no idea, I, and I was you know okay. told to look out for this phone number. So no, 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 absolutely not. Which you know what, and that's the beauty part of this, especially when it's live radio. <laughs> if I would have known, yeah. I would have said Richard Doty's calling in tonight, and I you know <laughs> absolutely not. I was told to look out for these last four digits, and uh, there you go. So. Um, and, and again, thank you. And let's uh, schedule uh, something in in the future. What you, you mentioned uh, that you were working on a television show or, or, or a documentary. What are you doing? It's a documentary. There's a couple of them I'm working on uh, that uh, are being filmed uh, in Nevada, uh, in around uh, Area 51. Not not in Area 51. Around it, Warm Springs. Uh, there's some things occurring out there that. They're really, really mysterious, so we're we're doing a, a show. Okay, so. all right. Well, good luck with that. Oh, I know what my question was. It was about Bill Cooper. Uh, was Bill Cooper? He's somebody that I respect. He's one of the reasons why I do radio today. Um, but was he an asset? No, was not mine. Okay. Oh, not yours. So you don't know. <laughs> No, no, I don't know. I don't know that he was. I don't know. I have no idea whether he was. Were, were there? No. Okay. And uh, was there any influence in the media, other show host or television through through the Air Force or the Pentagon on the UFO subject? Um, not that I was involved with. Uh, I, 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 I better not answer that. What I know is I better not answer it. So the answer is yes. Oh, otherwise, you would say no. Okay, fair enough. Uh, oh, are you under any uh, security agreements right now with the Air Force? No. Um, no, mine, mine ended. Mine ended in twenty twenty oh eight or uh, yeah, twenty oh eight. Yeah, uh, two thousand eight. And is um, uh, two, two, I'm sorry. Yeah, two, what did I say? Uh, uh, no, 2008, you said two, yeah. 2008. And well, so uh, you're retired. Are you are you receiving a retirement pay? I'm receiving a yeah, I'm receiving a It's okay. My dad my, my dad retired after 33 years. He's getting paid. I'm so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Are you yeah, in, I'm, I'm being paid. Are you Yes, absolutely. Okay. Are you in jeopardy of of though of your retirement pay by speaking about this kind of stuff on this show? No. So you're free to talk. No. Well, there are things that I won't talk about. I mean, there are things that I did that are still probably classified. And I'm not going to talk about it. Would you talk? The, the things that I know that are secretive or, or top secret or code word or things that are very sensitive, uh, I'm not going to talk about it. Would you but, would but you talk things to things that have already been out in the press? I, I'm 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 not afraid to talk about it. Would you talk to me about it in person or off of the air? About anything. You're supposed to say <laughs> it yes. On the question. It, it would be. It would depend on the question. Well, no, it would be. T- it, would, it would depend on the dinner, and I don't play around when I take <laughs> somebody out to dinner. I that I can promise. Well, it might be it might be that too. Yeah, I, uh, I like seafood. There you go, Richard Doty. <laughs> thank you for the surprise call. 
and let's do this okay. again, and we'll plan it out, and we'll actually have some structure to it. Okay. Okay, Jimmy. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. You too. You too. Well, there you go. Uh, yes, I was completely caught by surprise, and and I think that uh, if if anybody here at Fade to Black knew about this in advance. Uh, they are enjoying themselves knowing that I was caught completely by surprise. Uh, with that, I was told to look out for these last four numbers, and I, 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 t- I took the call uh, when, it, when it came in. I did not know. So there you go. Richard Doty, um, I, I was unprepared. I hope that for everybody here uh, in the Fade to Black audience that happened to listen to this live tonight, that I asked the questions that needed to be asked. I've uh, always wanted to have the opportunity to interview him, and I I hope that I did. Uh, I I hope that I asked the questions. Wow, I'm I'm just blown away. I'm blown away just like everybody else is. Um, Richard's history, his appearance in Mirage Men, uh, I was uncomfortable with. He was in unacknowledged. And I was a little bit uncomfortable with that, too, as well. And the there's two parts to his past. There's the urban legend part that has been out there where things get, uh, things get spread around. And then there's the other part. There's the official part that he has always spoken on. So what, you know, it, what's the real truth? And is it somewhere down the middle? Again, uh, Richard knows that it was his job, as he said tonight, to be a, a disinformation agent. And that's what he did for, he was an agent for the um, uh, OSI of the Air Force, and he worked uh, under orders. Okay, that's that's it. Um, is it an uncomfortable thing? Yes, it is for me. I am uh, completely uncomfortable with it. Completely. Completely. And the other part, and this is what I stressed with him tonight, uh, and I'm sure he's listening right now, which is this kind of stuff going on inside of the United States on American soil with American citizens is a bit funky. That's the part I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with. Whether they didn't spread disinfo, okay, well, that's that's his story, and he, he's going to stick to it and as well he should. But the other part of it is we're not enemy combatants. Whatever the Air Force wants to do with this overseas with in a foreign country or, you know, but here you go off of the Air Force base, off of the Air Force base to a civilian gathering, um, that's, that's, that's a bit funky. And to, to have assets reporting back to you from inside of these organizations, that's a bit, that's a bit funky to me. I'm a little bit, uh, uncomfortable with it and I'm not sure what really is going on. And I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know the truth. One thing is for sure. Me asking Richard Doty these questions, I can't go more direct to the source then Richard Doty, and I will do my best. And I think uh, he uh, he answered he answered everything. I got to give him credit for that. Coming into here, <laughs> he's uh, he's strong. Richard Doty is strong. All right, that concludes another week on Fade to Black. I uh, I'm taking the weekend off with my wife uh, this weekend. We are not working. We worked for the last uh, three four weeks in a row. Uh, So there you go. We're taking tomorrow off. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Doty. And you know what? Didn't have a chance to take any phone calls tonight. Well, if I did take a phone call, thank you. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palman, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. (coughs) Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitello, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster, Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich, Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast owned and copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. Cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe 
without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until Monday, everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.